You use your common sense. You use your visceral reaction, if I can use that word, to make a determination of whether or not you think this person is telling you the truth. None of these people know or knew O.J. Simpson. With the exception of the people who are together, they don't know each other. They're witnesses available to both sides. But in the search for truth, we're the ones who subpoenaed them and brought them in. Let's look at Denise Pilnack. She tells you that she was at home with her friend Judy T. Lander. She's across the street from 875 South Bundy. She's south and across the street. You recall that. She spoke of how eerily quiet, eerily quiet. Remember those words? It was at about 10.24 p.m. when T. Lander left her house. And she remembered that because she wanted to get T. Lander out of there. She'd been there all day and she wanted to use a computer or something to type some letters. Remember that? So she went outside on the porch with T. Lander, as I recall. And Pilnack just didn't come to you and tell you that. Pilnack did something else. She... And I believe, Your Honor, that's Exhibit 1237. She right, showed the us... The phone records. The phone record, Your Honor. She showed us that she got on the phone as soon as Pilnack left and called her mother, remember she said, in Gardena. And you look there on June 12th at 1025 p.m. She made a call to Gardena. She was able to fix the exact time that her friend left. And she said to us something very interesting. That there was quiet when her friend left, and the quiet continued for at least another 10 minutes. So that would be 1025 to 1035 at the earliest. She says that at 1035, it's the first time she heard dogs barking loudly that particular night. And so that she, as you will see along with Robert Heidstra, confirm each other. They don't necessarily know each other, but they confirm each other as to when this barking really, really began. Now, they weren't laying in bed and had been asleep like Eva Stein. They weren't like Miss Elsie Testert, who's across the street, who didn't really know what was happening. These are people who either outside or in that area who can come in here and tell you why they remember these particular times. They were wide awake, up and about, outside, around the time when this barking took place. Then we call this man Robert Heidstra. You know, because it came out that Robert Heidstra had been talking to the prosecution. You remember what he said. Now this is the man who's an interesting man who details cars. He's the man who is well known to the prosecution. Remember he talked to Detective Payne almost right away during the investigations to Payne. And he told Payne the same thing he told you in the course of this trial. This is what he said. He says that he lives nearby and he has these two elderly dogs, one of whom I recall was 14 years of age. And so these dogs walk kind of slowly. Remember that? He walks and he takes this route. Now that graphic up there shows you the route he takes. Let me tell you he left home a little bit late that particular Sunday evening. So at 10.15, he leaves home, and he proceeds on this route, and you know he's in that alleyway that runs parallel with Bundy, and he knows this neighborhood. He's been doing this for more than 14 years. He knows not only the neighborhood, he knows the dogs, he knows their barks, he knows the gates, he knows when they clank, he knows all of that. And isn't an interesting situation? Wouldn't you have thought that of all the witnesses in this trial, in this journey toward justice, this is the only witness who ever heard any voices. But they didn't call him. You know why? Because it doesn't fit in their timeline, as you're going to see. And so he tells you that, and you recall, he's directly opposite Mr. Cole Brown Simpson's condo in that alley when he hears what he believes is the Akita start barking. And that's at about 10. 35 p.m. He recognizes, he says, the Akita's bark since he walks that way, that same way, each and every evening. So while in that alleyway, east of 875 South Bundy, 
hears a voice yell, hey, hey, hey. And he says he then hears a gate slam. Now he goes on and says that at about 1040, 1045, he sees this white vehicle, which he describes clearly as a van or a Jeep. Now they were trying to tell you all these things about it being some Bronco, but he never said anything about any Bronco. He said a van or a Jeep. And the important part was, it's what he tells the detective, but he says it goes southbound on Bundy, away from Mr. where Mr. Simpson would live. And could you imagine in this area, in West Los Angeles, in Brentwood, the number of white vehicles there are and must be in that particular area? But the reason why they didn't call him was because at 1045, at 1045, O.J. Simpson cannot be guilty of this crime, can he? Now, how do we know that? How do we know that, ladies and gentlemen? Well, yesterday, in her zeal and advocacy, Ms. Clark tried to push the time back from 1040 or 1045 that Cato heard those thumps. She tried in her chart there to push it back, remember, to 1053. Some of you probably were surprised. There's been no testimony about that. So let me tell you, let me quote for you. Counsel, this is page 19873. This is Ms. Clark talking to one of her favorite witnesses, Mr. Cato Kalin. By Ms. Clark. And what happened with that picture when the thumps occurred? The picture tilted from, that would be right to left. The picture moved. Answer, yes it did. At that point, did you heard the thumps on the wall, sir? Approximately how long had you been on the phone with Rachel Ferraro? Remember he started, he called his friend, called his girlfriend. About a half hour, this is after he went back in the house, he called his girlfriend. And so approximately what time was it when you heard the thumps on the wall? Answer by Mr. Kalin, at about 1040. At about 1040. Now this is the time when the dogs first start to bark over there. At about 1040. Is that exact 1040, Ms. Clark says? Well, what I remember, I didn't look at the clock, but around 1040. Question, do you recall previously testifying that it was 1040 to 1045? Answer, yes. Question, okay, and is that correct? Answer, yes. Now, that's their witness. That's their witness. That's what he has to say. There's no question he's there. They know he's there. You know he's there. They don't call him. What about this search for truth? Can they handle the truth? You will be making that kind of decision. And so, we then know, according to this, that by the time Heidstra sees this vehicle turn south on Bundy, Cato Kalin has already heard the three thumps on the Rockingham wall outside of his room. And you know, that's so interesting because yesterday Miss Clark tried to change how those thumps sounded. Now remember, this is something that you will never forget probably. I won't come all the way over there, but let me just see if I can duplicate. Cato Kalin said, here's how he said those thumps sounded. One, two, three. Except he used that place up there. He said they were thumps. Almost like a signal. One, two, three. It's what he had to say. And of course, you recall that. Your notes are much better than ours, I'm sure. Apparently the prosecution, in their zeal and their obsession to win, would have you believe that Mr. Ornthal James Simpson is so amazing that he can be in two places at the same time, even though they're miles apart. And when Darden was talking to you today, everybody used Heitzer to say, well, on a Sunday evening, you could make it over there in about four minutes. And he said that. Well, in their own, in their own drive through, that Van Adder did, took five, between five and six minutes. You saw it, took close to six minutes. He didn't tell you that again today. And if you wanna get a flavor for how, we heard the word desperate a couple of times, but how witnesses were treated. Just ordinary witnesses, regular citizens. Let me share with you a transcript regarding Heidstra. Counsel, I'm going to be looking at um, 36368 through 36370. This is how Mr. Darden 
treated this witness who helped to shatter their timeline and establish O.J. Simpson's innocence. Didn't you tell us yesterday that the voice was a youthful voice? Yeah, sound like a young voice. Okay. And when you heard that voice, you thought that that was the voice of a young white male, didn't you? And there was an objection, you may recall. The voice sounded like the voice of a white male, Mr. Darden said. Answer, how could I say that it is a white male? I don't know the voice. It could be anybody there. Question, did you ever tell Mr. Stevens, my investigator, that it sounded like a white male? Answer, no. Never saw Mr. Stevens come in here and say that. Never said that. Answer, I don't recall that at all. I said it was a clear voice, but never what kind of white or brown or yellow. And then there was that second voice, correct? Right. And that second voice, that voice sounded deeper than the first voice, didn't it? Answer, a little bit, but I couldn't hardly hear it with the dogs, the commotion with two dogs there. It was very short. Did you ever tell anyone that the second voice was a deep voice? Answer was deep. It was deeper than the other one. Then, hey, hey, hey. Okay. And then we get to the question. At line 22, counsel. The second voice that you heard sounded like the voice of a black man. Is that correct? Objection. The witness, of course not. Now, you know, we can be advocates. Those questions, nobody ever came in to impeach that man. He told you he heard two voices. He told you when this took place. He told you why. Because he walks his dogs. He knows that neighborhood. A search for truth. You see, their job is not to just try to convict. Their job as prosecutors is to make sure the innocent go free also. To make sure all the witnesses come to your attention as we've had to do in this case. So you can see that these responsible citizen witnesses who came before you were oft times treated roughly and ridiculed and attacked by the prosecution in their obsession to win. You don't think Heister was attacked? Remember he was asked the question, some of the effect, are you, are you a citizen here? Because he's from France, apparently. And something about his job and his little apartment. Because he's a car detailer. Everybody is entitled to dignity. That's what we fought for in this country. You don't treat witnesses who just come in here. They don't get paid to tell the truth like that. Just purely and simply because they're not saying what you want them to say in your contorted version of what the truth ought to be. But you saw that yourself. I don't have to tell you about it. Interestingly enough, they chose not to mention even one of the defense witnesses in Ms. Clark's discussion of her timeline. The prosecutors noted that, that none of their timeline witnesses asked to be involved in this case. Well, none of the witnesses that we call asked to be involved in this case. They came forward. You saw how they were treated. But yet they told you what they observed. But perhaps the most important thing about them is these aren't any family members. These aren't people who know O.J. Simpson. These are just people who happen to be out there that particular night. And I think you can now see from that graphic how they all passed by there. We tried to make it as clear as we could. It's common sense. It's common sense, just like he said. It becomes very, very clear right at the outset. So if you Except the prosecution scenario, there's not enough time for O.J. Simpson to commit these murders, given the evidence that we understand. And let me just succinctly at the beginning help you understand where I'm going on this. Remember Bojiak that they like to talk about so much? When F. Lee Bailey cross-examined Bojiak the first time he was here. Remember Bailey got him to say this remarkable thing about Whoever left out that back gate turned and went back the other way. It's pretty interesting because I didn't see all those prints, but the, that's what he says. They went back to the scene. Remember that? That's what Bojack said. 
Darden said this morning, the killer are killers that went that way. They weren't in any hurry. They went that way and then came back. You take that along with the fact that the credible evidence regarding this struggle is it took between 5 to 15 minutes. And that's what Dr. Henry Lee, Dr. Michael Batten said. They not only told you that, they showed you why that was true. You know, while I'm about it, when I, just to digress for just a moment, Mr. Darden talked this morning about calling witnesses and not calling witnesses. Isn't that interesting? Now, they're the prosecutors. They are the ones who have the burden. In the history of man runneth not to the contrary, nobody around here can remember any time that the coroner who did the autopsy, the actual autopsies on these bodies, wasn't called by these prosecutors. What do you think that was? They didn't call the coroner. They chose instead to call Dr. Lakshmana, who came in here. They showed you what they thought about him. They, they talked about this man so badly. I mean, for eight days, we heard Dr. Lakshmana talk to you. They talk about length of time in this trial. Let me put that in perspective for you. For eight days, Lakshmana sat on that stand and went through direct examination by Brian Kilberg. Check your notes if you think I'm wrong about that. Bob Shapiro got up and took three and a half hours and demolished him because at the end of the day, Lakshmanan told you this. Well, these were deaths that were caused by stab wounds. And the time of death was between 9 and 12. There were all those discussions about big ticket items and big ticket items. And when you get back in the jury room, you'll, you'll have a lot of fun trying to figure out all those red and blue marks that they drew all over the, the corners. They spent eight days trashing their own corner and they didn't call him now why is that in this search for truth they call somebody else who's not even there at the autopsies who has the benefit of our experts michael Batten and barbara wolf who point out to him the mistakes that golden has made he then runs in here and testifies about those mistakes that we had discovered remember ladies and gentlemen in this search for truth, our experts were in place right away. O.J. Simpson was paying for these experts to find the killer or killers. And you'll recall the evidence that Dr. Lee, Michael Batten, Barbara Wolf were offered to them at the beginning. So the idea is that from the beginning, there was this search for truth. So I mentioned that parenthetically at this point because I think it's important you talk about not calling witnesses in every murder case. It's basic that you've got to call the coroner. But they did a number of things in this case, ladies and gentlemen, that had never been seen before. Off the top of our heads, four detectives going to the scene to notify somebody who's not even the next of kin. The detective carries blood 25 or 30 miles around in his pocket. They do things that you have never heard of before. In this case, is it because it's Orenthal James Simpson? And so as we look then at the timeline and the importance of this timeline, I want you to remember these words. Like the defining moment in this trial, the day Mr. Darden asked Mr. Simpson to try on those gloves and the gloves didn't fit. Remember these words. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. And we're going to be talking about that throughout. So to summarize, if you take the witnesses who we presented, who stand unimpeached, unimpeached, and if you are left with dogs starting to bark at 10.35 or 10.40, 10.40 let's say, and we know from the most qualified individuals, Henry Lee and Michael Batten. This was a struggle that took from 5 to 15 minutes. It's already 10.55. And remember, the thumps were at 10.40 or 10.45. O.J. Simpson could not be guilty 
he is then entitled to an acquittal. And we have talked to you, and you've heard from the court, and my colleagues talked to you about this whole idea of circumstantial evidence. And I want to talk to you a little more about that now. We have shown you the incredible evidence that it would be impossible. O.J. could not, would not, did not commit these crimes. And where you have a circumstantial evidence case, this becomes very, very important. The prosecution then must disprove our timeline beyond a reasonable doubt. And if they don't, you must acquit. He would then be entitled to an acquittal. So let's see if we can look quickly at this jury instruction, sufficiency of circumstantial evidence generally. Mr. Douglas is going to help me today. <clears throat> May I have just a second here? called sufficiency of circumstantial evidence, evidence generally. And to be as accurate as possible, let me allude to all of it, lest I favor one portion or the other, and together we can consider it. This is the law that His Honor has already given you as it relates to circumstantial evidence, which this is, in this case, about opportunity to commit these crimes. However, a finding of guilt as to any crime may not be based on circumstantial evidence unless the proved circumstances are not only, one, consistent with the theory that the defendant is guilty of the crime, but two, cannot be reconciled with any other rational conclusion. Further, each fact which is essential to complete a set of circumstances necessary to establish the defendant's guilt must be proved beyond a reasonable doubt. In other words, before an inference essential to establish guilt may be found to have been proved beyond a reasonable doubt, each fact or circumstance upon which such inference necessarily rests must be proved beyond a reasonable doubt. Also, if the circumstantial evidence as to any particular count, either one of these counts, is susceptible of two reasonable interpretations, one of which points to guilt, the other which points to innocence, you as jurors must adopt that interpretation which points to the defendant's innocence and reject that interpretation which points to his guilt. If on the other hand, one interpretation of such evidence appears to you to be reasonable and the other interpretation to be unreasonable, you must accept the reasonable interpretation and reject the unreasonable. I put that up at this very moment because you've just seen the timeline, which is circumstantial evidence of O.J. Simpson's innocence because he couldn't have done the crime given this time. So under that scenario, even if the prosecution's timeline was reasonable, if they're both reasonable, I think you must agree ours is reasonable, becomes your duty to adopt that which points towards innocence. But even further, if theirs is unreasonable and ours is reasonable, he's still entitled to an acquittal. The only way they're entitled to conviction, if ours is unreasonable and theirs is reasonable. And I think you can see and understand that's not true, that shouldn't happen, that's not the facts of this case. So before I look at their timeline, let me just see if I can summarize what I believe the prosecution has tried to tell you about their theory in this case. And this is just kind of rough, but listening to them yesterday, they tried to tell you that an insanely jealous man stalks his ex-wife, stabs her and a male visitor in a murderous rage, leaves a trail of blood to his home, barely catches a plane for Chicago, in a rush to go there, leaves one glove at the murder scene and one glove behind his house. In the defense of this case, you have heard evidence about O.J. Simpson's great life. Not only did he have a great life, 
He had a great day that day. He's playing golf. Comes back from being out of town all week long. Comes back to go to his child's recital. He goes to that recital. Prepares in the evening. Get something to eat, a hamburger. By the way, I have to stop at this point. I'm glad Miss Clark doesn't know this, but you know, if you've ever been to McDonald's, they don't like you to bring $100 bills in there. You know, you can't get $100 bills changed there, generally. So some of these things about common sense, some people don't know. Beyond the evidence here. Well, all right, thank Proceed. you. Use your common sense about fast food places. He then takes a shower, barely catches his plane in Chicago. Someone murders his wife and this male visitor for reasons unknown in this trial. Others seek to implicate him as the most obvious suspect. The investigation becomes a tragic combination of sloppy errors and cover-ups to try and achieve his conviction. Those are going to be pretty much the hypothesis that you've heard and will be hearing in this case. Under whatever scenario, based on what I've already told you in this first hour of the argument, this man is entitled to an acquittal. But let's now turn briefly to the prosecution's timeline scenario. And you heard Ms. Clark yesterday talk about this timeline and talk about these witnesses and she relies very heavily on this Pablo Fenves. You remember him, he's one of the early, early witnesses who started off I think talking about a plaintiff wheel of a dog at 10.30 and he got pushed back to 10.15. But it's interesting because now Darden not Marsha Clark, has now come back and conceded, well, you know, maybe it really was later. They did a pretty good job. Um, you know, so he's saying that. But Pen Penvis told us that he, you know, he's in that alleyway, down the alleyway and across from Nicole Brown Simpson lives. 1015, 1030, whatever, 1020. Eva Stein, next door, was asleep. Claimed she was awakened. You ever wake up at night? You might see the time right, you might not. She says about 10.20 or so, she thinks she hears dogs barking. Well, I presume that dogs bark throughout that neighborhood all the time. And we don't know, and that's the problem. We're trying to convict somebody or set the time of death by a dog barking. Louis Karpf, her boyfriend comes home sometime after 10.20. And then, of course, Miss Elsie Tistert, the lady from across the street, doesn't know when or what was precisely when she heard the barks. Then there's Mark Storfer, and Mark Storfer is an interesting man, because you remember he's the man who always set his watch five minutes fast, he says, presumably. He told us here in testimony, counsel, 17190, says at 1028, that's when I looked at the TV, which was a couple of minutes after I'd gotten in the room, right? Okay. And then he talks about, I looked out the window of our bedroom that faces North Bundy to see if I could see where that dog was or what was going on. It was pretty dark and I couldn't see anything unusual and I couldn't locate the dog. I also looked out the west facing window of our bedroom to see if the dog was further over to the west. We faced the alley on the west side and I could not see anything at that time either. Now. This witness becomes kind of important, doesn't he? Because the prosecution is going to tell you that no matter what time it is, whether it's 10.40 or 10.45, or whether it's 10.15 or 10.20 or 10.25, or Mr. Mr. Darden makes this big quantum leap. The Bronco was there. Where's Mark Storfer, who looks down that alley, and what exhibit is this, Mr. Harris? Do we know? Exhibit number 38, Your Honor. This is looking northbound down that alleyway. And you recall this because we've all been out there and you'll recall where Miss Nicole Brown Simpson's condo is located and you recall that it's sitting out in the driveway there. Right there. It was a black Jeep Cherokee as I recall. And you see this man can presumably look up this alleyway. You didn't see any white Bronco Nobody ever tells you about any white Bronco parked back there. Doesn't tell you about any car parked back there. 
So when you see people tell you about mountains of evidence and oceans of evidence, their oceans soon become little streams. Their mountains become molehills when you look at the facts. And so we go on, in addition to Mark Storfer and looking up that alley and seeing nothing or seeing no car or didn't see a dog, we hear about the other witnesses who become pretty much part of the timeline. Ms. Clark does take some licenses regarding time. She says that Mr. Goldman leaves Metzaluna, she says about 9.50 p.m. She says he goes home and he changes clothes, that he talked to Stuart Tanner about getting together later that, after, that evening. Remember that? Talked about going to Baja Cantina out at the marina. You know, wouldn't you think it would be logical to expect if you worked all day, when you went home to change clothes, you might have showered, you might have gotten something to eat. Especially if later on, when you hear Mr. Sheck, you look at the amount of food, undigested food, that was still in the stomach of these two victims. But in a rush to judgment, in a rush to contort these facts, this Clark tells you yesterday, let's give him five minutes. He's been working all day. He's got to change clothes. He's got to come home. Let's give him five minutes or ten minutes. Be correct. She says, let's give him ten minutes. That seems to me to be really, really fast. And what it really is, ladies and gentlemen, is more of that speculation. She doesn't know how long Mr. Goldman was there. None of us know that. We know he changed clothes. She has absolutely no idea. But, so you understand that when you look at when somebody says something like that to you. And then as part of their timeline, she tells you yesterday that there's something sinister in Mr. Simpson seeking change to buy a Big Mac from McDonald's. I suppose that if you're in this jealous rage, if the fuse is running so short, it's interesting, isn't it, to stop, go get a hamburger at McDonald's. Does that make any sense to any of you? Does it make any sense to you to drive to McDonald's? And there's no evidence that he tried to tell Cato Kalin not to come. The evidence is that these two men got in the Bentley and went to McDonald's. The evidence is that while O.J. Simpson is in this murderous rage, he's worried about money to tip the skycaps at the airport because he has $100 bills. So he gets $20 from Cato Kalin. What's unusual about that? Cato Kalin's living there for free, so I suppose he could give him $20. Then Cato Kalin wants to go get something to eat. And Ms. Clark says they could have gone to a restaurant. Well, you could do anything, I suppose. But the facts are they went to McDonald's to get a hamburger. O.J. Simpson ate the hamburger. Presumably, he was hungry. Now what's sinister about that? Unless you're cynical in your view totally of this case. Cato Kalin, their witness, they called him. They turned on him. You observed him. I ask you to hold him up to the same standards you do all the other witnesses. But I ask you, don't, quote, don't misquote him. Tell the truth about what he had to say. And so when he says 1040, or 1040 to 1045, don't try to make it 1052. So if you believe in this prosecution's theory, there's this blood leading down to this rear walkway. And Ms. Clark told us yesterday and unveiled her theory. Here's what they ask you to believe. O.J. Simpson comes home from these brutal murders in a Bronco that he must be driving awfully fast to get back in this time frame. He parks his Bronco out there, the Rockingham Gate, somehow gets in the gate, gets down the side of his house, and what does she tell you? He bumps into the air conditioning. Now let's, let's, let's examine that for a minute. The evidence is that O.J. Simpson has lived in this house for 17 years. Who do you think knows this place better or the best of all? This is his estate. This is where he lives. This is where he's raised his children. This is where he's been married. This is where he had two marriages. He knows this place. So as part of their fantasy, their theory, their speculation, they have O.J. Simpson walking down this walkway, running into an air conditioning. Well, he ran into the air conditioning, 
Where's all the bruises that he got from running the air conditioning? Where's the sound that he made? That doesn't make any sense. You see, the reason why they come up with this running into the air conditioning, because they can't say he climbed over the fence. Because there's too much shrubbery there and it's not broken. Now, you really don't know if he could climb over the fence with this arthritis. But they have him then walking down this walkway, bumping into the air conditioning. But ladies and gentlemen, you know, we're talking about common sense here. Bumping into the air conditioning, and then he just leaves? Is that what happens? And let's look at this. Thank you, Mr. Douglas. You all remember this. And what, what exhibit is this, Mr. Douglas? Excuse me. I'll stand over here so I won't be in your way. Thank you. Under this scenario, under their scenario, while Alan Park is out here somewhere, looking over in this direction, they have O.J. Simpson rushing back, parking the Bronco out here, and some way or other, he gets all the way down here. Remember, Furman told you how far that was. Gets all the way down here where this air conditioning is, out here by Cato Kalin's room. You'll see this right here. And they have him running into this air conditioning so he doesn't know his own house. And he's all the way back here, and she says the reason he's back here is because he's going to go back here and he's going to bury the knife in the clothes. Now, isn't that something? How does she know that? Just make that up out of whole cloth? Do you believe that's reasonable? Is that reasonable to you? Does anybody on this jury believe that? That's what you were told yesterday. He runs in this air conditioning and then just, you know, he bumps in it and he drops his glove. That's what she told you. Doesn't make any sense at all, does it, ladies and gentlemen? Doesn't make any sense at all. No sound from Cato Kalin. And then what kind of, you know, the sound has always been very confusing. Maybe not to you, but to me. When Cato Kalin goes, it's more like a signal than anything else. Come out here or whatever. But those are the facts of Cato Kalin and what happened. And that's her theory. That's her reasonable rational theory that you have to buy into, which I think that you will find to be totally ridiculous. I remember, down this same way, there is a door into that side room there. Mr. Simpson wanted to get in his house. What would stop him from going in that side door? Who knows his house better? If he wanted to be, not be seen, I'm supposed that he would know better than anybody else. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense at all. What they're now trying to tell you. And here's something else that's equally implausible. She tells you that the reason why Mr. Simpson couldn't stop and hide these clothes is because he's too famous and too well known. Remember that? She said, O.J. Simpson is too famous and too well known to stop and try to hide clothes or whatever of that nature. Well, let's take that just a little bit further. Part of what makes their theory so ridiculous is that is O.J. Simpson going to get in a white Bronco that's well known in Brentwood, drive over to his ex-wife's house, park the Bronco in this well-lit alleyway that you've just seen, leave the car there, everybody knows him, knows that car? That's equally preposterous. So she can't have it both ways. He's too famous to stop and try to throw things in a dumpster, the way she put it. Isn't he equally too famous to be driving this car to go over there under these circumstances? That is preposterous. So if you believe the prosecution's theory, and they told you all this about a bloody trail, where's the blood back there, ladies and gentlemen? There's not one drop of blood. Where's the blood back there? Where's the trail that leads to that glove? And further, look at this. Look at this, ladies and gentlemen. That's something I'm making up. You're seeing this with your own eyes. Look at the glove. Now, when that glove is picked up, do you remember, the, is there any blood on the ground? Any blood on that shrubbery? Any blood on anything there? Where's the blood? Furman and Van Adder, as we discuss them later, will say that when they get that glove, after 6 o'clock in the morning, it's still moist and sticky. Remember their testimony? Where's the blood on the ground? Where's the blood on the leaves around there? Where's any of that? That glove looks as though it's been placed there. That glove looks as though it's been placed.
placed there. If you look at A, you'll see how far it is out to the street. So their theory doesn't hold water, it doesn't make sense, and so they get mad at Cato Kalin, and they tell you why he's biased, he's just indebted to O.J. Simpson, so we just can't trust him, but yet they want you to trust him, about the knocks on the wall, and he becomes part of their theory. But their theory doesn't make sense, and when you were back there deliberating on this case, you're never going to be ever able to reconcile this timeline and the fact there's no blood back there that O.J. Simpson would run into an air conditioning on his own property and then under her scenario he still has the knife and the clothes but what did she tell you yesterday well he still has the knife and he's in these bloody clothes and presumably in bloody shoes and what does he do he goes in the house now thank heaven Judge Ito took us on a jury view You've seen this house. You've seen this carpet. If he went in that house with bloody shoes, with bloody clothes, with his bloody hands, as they say, where's the blood on the doorknob? Where's the blood on the light switch? Where's the blood on the banister? Where's the blood on the carpet? It's like almost white carpet going up those stairs. Where's all that blood trail they've been banding about in this mountain of evidence? You'll see it's little more than a river or a stream. They don't have any mountain or uh, ocean of evidence. It's not so because they say so. That's just rhetoric. We, this afternoon, are talking about the facts. And so, it doesn't make any sense. It just doesn't fit. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. And so, she has him then still with the knife, still with these bloody clothes, and then she does something very unusual. Again on the time. Remember she gave Mr. Goldman 10 minutes to get dressed and to go over to Nicole Brown Simpson's house with this envelope. <laughs> Mr. Simpson, she says, who walks in this house in the walkway, and by the way, they were wrong. She was wrong about something else again I'd like to read you. She's wrong in her description. Of Allen Park. I can locate it. Alan Park says he saw this figure in the walkway only and so that we're clear about that let me just read it to you I don't have to just tell you what I think it is I'm gonna read it for you 20571 council line 17 yes I saw a figure come down well not come down but I saw a figure come into the entranceway of the house just about where the driveway starts. So a figure come into the entranceway of the house. Just about where the driveway starts. Now, do you see that right there, the driveway is? That's what he said. Yesterday they were trying to put it all down here and have him come, because that was convenient to their theory. But that's not what the witness said. You look at the facts of this case and you'll see. Not what they tell you. Continuing it on. There is absolutely no evidence at all that Mr. Simpson ever tried to hide a knife or clothes or anything else on his property. You recall that Furman, and when I get to Furman, we'll be spending some time on him, as you might imagine, but one of the things he said was that he encountered cobwebs further down that walkway, indicating if that part is true, and I don't vouch for him at all, there had been nobody down that pathway for quite some time. And so she talks about O.J. being very, very recognizable. She talks about O.J. Simpson getting dressed up to go commit these murders. And just before we break for our break, I was thinking... Last
to myself, maybe I can demonstrate this graphically. Good time, Your Honor. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take our mid-afternoon recess at this time. Remember all my admonitions to you. We'll stand in recess for 15. And Mr. Cochran, you may continue with your final argument. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your patience thus far, and we'll start up again and see if we can make it to dinner. Um, when we left, just before we broke, I was sharing with you a knit hat or a knit cap that we've heard so much about in this case, and it reminded me that there was testimony early on that uh, Detective Lang had uh, refused basically to pick up a knit cap inside the Brown residence uh, that was shown to him. I think by some of the lawyers and one of the investigators on that date, because these are fairly common. But they don't really disguise anybody who's noticeable, do they? And although I was the guinea pig here this afternoon, if you were to put a knit cap on, how's that going to disguise you? We've been together. I know your face anywhere now. And you know mine. And the people in Brentwood, in West Los Angeles, would know O.J. Simpson. They know his car. They know him. That's where he lives. Even the prosecutors say he's so famous that he can't go anywhere where he wouldn't be recognized. Now, one of the things about this people's timeline or whatever is that you recall that OJ's, some of OJ's bags were already packed outside of the house on that bench when Cato came outside to investigate the thumps, which he'd heard. And this is interesting because the prosecutors have kind of talked across purposes on this. Cato at some point comes out because he hears these thumps allegedly. And he has a little tiny flashlight or I think the court called it a pin, a pin light or a mag light or something like that. And it was something small because it's dark back down that walkway. And apparently he went part way down that walkway and then he came back. It's interesting, isn't it? He came back and at some point he lets park in. I remember all these questions about opening the gate and everything. Remember there's a dog there. Isn't there a dog there named Chachi? There's a lot of talk about these dogs and you've heard a little bit about these dogs. But one thing that I think is, is the prosecutors make these kind of wild speculations. You now know that the Akita dog was bought by OJ as was Chachi. Because Remember one of the dogs died and like a good dad he let the dog stay at the other house sometime with his son Justin. And they named the dog after Cato. Because I think the understanding of what we've, you've heard from, from uh, Arnell. But at any rate, I point that out because we know there was another dog over there named Chachi. A black dog. Black chow. But while he, Cato is out looking for these thumps, of the, what happens to these thumps, Mr. Simpson talks to him. In fact, they go in the house together because Mr. Simpson is going to help him look or help him find a larger flashlight. And then someone says, or he's reminded, that Mr. Simpson is running late for his trip. So then he then takes off. My understanding of the facts is Mr. Simpson said, I'll call you later and have you put the alarm on. Because he was getting out of there. Parks was already there. But I think the interesting thing to remember is that some of the bags were already down, including that golf bag, were already down there was not any unexpected trip. He started putting things down there. If you look at everything in a cynical fashion, you heard this morning, aha, there was a knapsack over or a nap bag or some little bag they were talking about over in the driveway. Well, if you're a golfer, isn't it reasonable to assume there's golf balls in there? And if you put that in your golf bag, I mean, what's the big deal? Because they've got to try to theorize and try to explain anything. Explain everything, which they can't explain. They weren't there. They rushed to judgment, 
and it leads to this kind of wild speculation. You have to do that when you don't have a case. And that's all you've seen them do time after time after time. With regard to that walkway, lest I be totally clear to you, if O.J. Simpson had been the one for whatever reason to walk into that air conditioning, where's the hair and trace? Where's the fiber? Where's the blood? They want to tell you about his hands, fingers bleeding one minute, then it stops bleeding. In Ms. Ms. Clark's scenario, he bleeds, it coagulates, stops bleeding, then it starts bleeding again. Because that's convenient for her theory. You know, as I listen to both of them, I wanted to call them doctor. Dr. Clark? Because Dr. Clark told you, well, gee, look at that blood drop. That, that cut wasn't big enough for that blood drop. She's not any doctor. How does she know that? Dr. Darden, for the love and the forlorn. He, he knows everything about relationships. He just speculates on and on and on. He's got this great, vivid imagination. The only thing is, this is real life. This isn't anything for murder, she wrote. If they tried to sell this story to murder, she wrote, they'd send it back and said, that's unbelievable. You're going to see that as we tie it together. But it's nice to have vivid imaginations, but not in this courtroom. Because here, you are searching for truth on this journey for justice. So we know that Cato had some concerns. Uh, he was looking around. We know that at some point, Mr. Simpson comes down the stairs carrying the Louis Vuitton bag or whatever. And then Mr. Simpson leaves about 11, 11.02 for the airport. I think that's pretty clear based upon the evidence. And you recall that Ms. Clark again gives Mr. Simpson five minutes to rush in. According to her theory, he rushes in, changes clothes, disposes of all these clothes, showers, packs, does everything, and comes downstairs and says, composes himself. Now, can you imagine that? I mean, who do they think they're talking to? In five minutes, he does all these things. And then they tell you that, you know, under this post-homicidal uh, way you act, uh, you get yourself all composed and you just do this. This is preposterous. They're not experts. They can't testify. Those are just their, their wildest, rankest theories. You use your common sense when they tell you things like that. O.J. Simpson was O.J. Simpson. The way he always appeared by the people who knew him and talked to him. We'll talk more about that when we talk about demeanor. But the reason they can't explain his demeanor and the way he acted like he always acted, they then talk about, well, you can't tell who's a murderer. I mean, those are all real convenient words, aren't they? But they fly in the face of reasonable activity by a reasonable man on that particular night. So there's Alan Park. O.J. Simpson comes down within five minutes of the time they, they believe he goes upstairs. No time to dispose of bloody clothes. What about blood on the carpet? What about dirt on this white carpet? How does he shower? How does he get dressed? I mean, it doesn't make any sense at all, does it? Park himself says the golf bag was already packed and ready to go when he pulled into the driveway. And Miss Clark went to great trouble to tell you how credible she thought Mr. Park was and how he tried to lay everything out. And I think, by and large, uh, we agree with that. But I think if you're going to quote Mr. Park, you ought to quote him accurately and not attempt to mislead or whatever. And so what I did was I went back to the transcript again, where Ms. Clark told you and showed you that photograph yesterday about whether or not Mr. Park saw or was looking at the Bronco or looking for the Bronco on the night of June 12th. Remember that? She told you yesterday I spent a long time with him. And so I remembered. Did I ask him questions? And his response. I asked him at some point, I'm asking you if you look to, made an effort to see if there was a car parked. Answer, no. Was that a correct answer at that time? Answer, yes. All right, question. There might have been a car parked there and you didn't see it? Answer, correct. And the reason why you don't know one way or the other is because you weren't focusing on any cars or paying any attention. Isn't that right? 
And I went on to ask still another part of this question. Basically, your goal was to get Mr. O.J. Simpson, try to get him to the airport on time, isn't it? Answer, that's correct. Question, that is what you ended up doing, isn't it, sir? Answer, yes. And that's the testimony. So it's fine to come up here and tell you, because they want to fit their theory, that, well, he never, he didn't see that Bronco out there and do all this drama, but isn't it better to read the record if you want to be accurate, which I've just done for you? Now, isn't it reasonable to ask Mr. Park also, well, Mr. Park, if you were around the premises there and you were up at Ashford and then down at Rockingham, did you ever hear a Bronco come driving up? Did you ever hear a door slam? Did you ever hear an engine of a Bronco? And fortunately, we ask him some of those questions. I'd ask him about hearing a, seeing a Bronco in the past, and remember he talked about seeing one back in 88 or something of that nature. And so then I ask him this question. And would I be correct in assuming that those engines can be loud on occasion? Those cars, meaning the Broncos. Answer, could be. Question, you didn't hear the engines on any cars or anything that sounded like a Ford Bronco that night, did you? Answer, no. Now, again, I've read from the transcript for you. I previously read to you about where Mr. Park said he saw Mr. Simpson in the entrance way of the house. We'll put that aside. So we know that Mr. O.J. Simpson was preparing to leave for this trip that had been long planned. And when we summarize then the two timelines, it seems to me that their timeline is not even reasonable. It doesn't make any sense. It's a much less credible version than the testimony you've heard from our witnesses. Their version does in no way disprove, disprove the defense timeline. We don't have to even put that forward, but we did. There then must be a reasonable doubt. Consider everything that Mr. Simpson would have had to have done in a very short time on their timeline. He would have had to drive over to Bundy as they've described in this little limited time frame where there's not enough time. Kill two athletic people in a struggle that takes five to fifteen minutes. Walk slowly from the scene. Return to the scene, supposedly looking for a missing hat and glove and poking around. Go back to this alley a second time. Drive more than five minutes to Rockingham where nobody hears him or sees him. Either stop along the way to hide these bloody clothes and knives, etc., or take them in the house with him where they're still hoisted by their own petard because there's no blood, there's no trace, there's no nothing. So that's why the prosecution has had to try and push back their timeline. Even to today, they're still pushing it back because it doesn't make any sense, it doesn't fit. That's why they abandoned Ellen Aronson, why they abandoned Dan Mandel, why they didn't want to call Denise Pilnack, why they didn't want to call Robert Heistra. That's why we're now hearing this preposterous add-on of time that the thumps may have occurred at 10.15. That's Ms. Clark's wish list, but that's not the evidence in this case. Now let's turn our attention for a moment and let's look at some other things that don't fit in this case. So I started to say before, perhaps the single most defining moment in this trial was the day they thought they would conduct this experiment on these gloves. They had this big buildup with Mr. Rubin, who had been out of the business for five, six, seven, eight years. He'd been in marketing even when he was there. But they were going to try to demonstrate to you that these were the killer's gloves and these gloves would fit Mr. Simpson. You don't need any photographs to understand this. I suppose that vision is indelibly imprinted in each and every one of your minds of how Mr. Simpson walked over here and stood before you and you saw four simple words. 
the gloves didn't fit. And all their strategy started changing after that. Reuben was called back here more than all their witnesses, four times altogether. Reuben testified more than the investigating officers in this case. Because their case from that day forward was slipping away from them. And they knew it, and they could never, ever recapture it. We may all live to be 100 years old, and I hope we do. But you'll always remember that those gloves, when Darden asked them to try them on, didn't fit. They know they didn't fit. And no matter what they do, they can't make them fit. They can talk about latex gloves. Did it make any difference? They could talk about shrinkage. But we did something even better, didn't we? We brought a man who won the Dondero Award, Dr. Herb McDonald, who did an experiment on these aris like gloves. They wanted to talk about liquid or blood shrinking them. You'll see it up there. And what do you say? They don't shrink. Put as much blood as you can on them. They don't shrink. Doesn't work. They have the power of the state. They could have done their own demonstration. They didn't because you know he's right. So we went about and proved to you these things. We didn't just stand up here and speculate as to what might be. We called a leading witness who came in and passed that on for you. So you could see the overlays on there. They cannot explain that. They could have called witnesses, they didn't. We call the witness, prove beyond any doubt, those gloves don't shrink. The gloves didn't fit Mr. Simpson, because he's not the killer. Now, then they will say, and Ms. Clark said the other day, well, gee, uh, these gloves have been thawed, and they've been frozen, and they've been all those things. But remember Susan Brockbank? Those gloves were measured on June 21st, 1994. Those gloves are basically the same size now as they were June 21st. So that won't work. They come, they tell you all these things, but it won't work. And so, if you looked at gloves, here's the overlay. And there's something else about these gloves that I want to take a minute and share with you before we talk about Mr. Rubin and his testimony. You saw these pictures of the gloves? We had a couple of pairs of Aris Light. And when you have gloves that don't fit can hardly do anything with them makes it very very tough I put on a pair of Aeroslite gloves that are real tight and you can see how tough it is to try to get these on my hands but I put them on anyway here it's the same kind of gloves that Dr. McDonald did his experiment with so there'd be no mistake about the leather and all those things they like to talk about. It's hard to get on. Not as hard as Mr. Simpson, but they're hard to get along. The reason I want you to see these gloves, because they want to tell you that when you take off gloves, you take them off by this V portion. Remember this? Somebody testified. You don't take off gloves that way. One of the people's witnesses said that. You don't take them off that way. So we're asked to believe that in this tremendous struggle, that night in which Ron Goldman fought so valiantly, that somehow or other, in that struggle, somebody took these gloves. The way you pull gloves off, I have to tell you this, you pull them off like this. Even Reuben knew this. Pull them off like this. The gloves came off like this, not through any way like that. And so I think it's interesting and you look at these gloves and you look at what they're trying to have you believe. They talked a lot about in their rebuttal case about the glove pictures and the glove photographs. Remember that each of the glove photographs were taken, or pictures of Mr. Simpson, were taken in the winter. You know the evidence. Mr. Simpson was living in New York, generally from August through January when he's at football season, or working for NBC Sports. Um, generally in Southern California, you don't need or wear winter dress gloves in California. You don't go skiing in Aris light gloves. And you remember, 
that the police, in searching Mr. Simpson's house, remember Detective Lang? They searched O.J. Simpson's house for gloves, for shoes, for clothes. Found one brown glove. I want you to look at it at some point, the brown glove that looks very similar to the brown gloves that Mr. Simpson Objection. Uh, one brown. What? That's one brown glove. <laughs> These, this glove was picked up on June 28th. But what I was saying was, this glove came out of Simpson's house. And I ask you to look at this glove. You'll have this back in the jury room. Look at it compared to some of the gloves he wore that day. That the on the photographs. The, there were no heiress like gloves in O.J. Simpson's house. That's the point. They took this one glove on June 28th. That's the point. And the point is, quite simply, Richard Rubin, let's put him in perspective. Bob Blazer questioned him on his fourth trip here we discovered a letter that he sent to the prosecution. This man had become a soldier in the prosecution's army. Wrote him a letter saying he wanted to come to their victory party. The problem with that letter was he wrote the letter before we'd ever had a chance to put on our case. That solidifies the rush to judgment, doesn't it? Because in America, you have a right to wait until you hear all the evidence. That's what makes this country great. People not making up their minds at the beginning. You don't decide a baseball game or a football game at halftime. You wait until the end. That's what this judge tells you every day. Keep an open mind. You've heard everything. But Reuben wasn't going to do that. He was getting ready for the victory party. In his own letter that he wrote to them, and he asked further, send me your cards. I want Mr. Hodgman's card and Ms. Clark's card. He'll build a memorial to himself on his wall for the number of times he'd come out here. You talk about people who want to be involved in this case, you stack him up to those other people who didn't want to be here. Richard Rubin is one of those people, and it goes to his bias. It goes to his interest. I'm telling you the facts. We told you about this letter. You've got to deal with that if you're going to be fair and impartial in this case. And then, as with all the prosecution's evidence, they're going to tell you that something is not like what it seems. They take a Bloomingdale's receipt in which there's no size or color or anything else on this receipt. And I find this particularly interesting because it's part and parcel of the prosecution's case, isn't it? The way they've done things in this case. Now, this is this, this famous purchase in December of 1990, wasn't it? The lot number or the style number is 70268. That's what it says. It doesn't say anything about 70263. It's two items. It says $77. It's $77 is what it says for those two items. It doesn't say anything about $55. It says $77. And it doesn't say anything about color or size or anything of that nature. It doesn't say anything about any mufflers. But yet you've been treated and told, oh, these had to be heiress like gloves. That looks like a computer-generated receipt. I wonder how, if it was incorrectly input, it didn't spit it out. This transaction apparently went through, and whatever was purchased was purchased. The point is, it's part of, again, the weakness of the prosecution's case in telling you one thing, and the record shows something else. You don't have any receipt anywhere when you get back there that says anything about any 70263. You don't have one witness who ever says that Nicole Brown Simpson bought any Aris lights and gave them to O.J. Simpson. There is no such witness because it didn't happen. And the rest of it is speculation and theory on their part. Cynical speculation, I might add, to try to rush to judgment and win at any cost. Now, you heard during Mr. Darden's effective argument last night 
a lot of statements. And just before I get to that part, let me say a couple other things about Mr. Rubin. Might be appropriate. Remember, Mr. Rubin's an interesting witness. When he was brought back out here this last time, he was asked, well, look, how many glove manufacturers are there in the world? And he acknowledged there are over 100. And then Bob Blazer asked him a question, well, you know, how many did you check with? Two. He checked with two and then he stopped looking. Because remember, he found out that this brasser stitching could be made on Singer sewing machines. Some of you may know, about, may know more about that than I do, but they stopped making them after a period of time. But he stopped looking after a period of time, never called anybody else. And that's interesting because that compares the way the prosecution witnesses have conducted themselves throughout. Compare the fact that he stopped looking after two with Agent Martz, who finds three of the four things you need to find EDTA on the sock and the back gate. And rather looking carefully for the characteristic, the fourth one, he stopped searching. He uses a far less discriminating test. Consider the, the EAPB found under Nicole Brown Simpson's fingernails where they try to come in and tell you it's a degraded BA. And on cross-examination again, Blazer got Matheson to admit there was no specific support in any of the literature for a BA degrading to a B. And this was, by all accounts, a double-banded B. The reason they didn't want to pursue that? Because she may have scratched somebody with a B-type. But they never pursued those things. The second had it Bundy. The Bundy location inside, when the the defense investigator finds this hat. Nobody wanted to collect it. They refused, in fact, to collect it. When we, in this trial, before you, discovered that evidence had been moved at Bundy, and that a key piece of evidence, the piece of paper, had disappeared, they didn't do anything to find out about it that we know of. We're concerned about those kinds of things. But it's important, then, when you look at Reuben, because you put him along with the other prosecution witnesses and the things that they've had to say. I've told you about that Bloomingdale's receipt. I've told you about Brenda Vimage who came in. One other thing about Brenda Vimage that was interesting, she was a lady who, that was the day, I won't forget that day ever probably, because that was the day that, she's a pretty tough witness. I was just trying to talk about receipts and things. She's pretty tough. And I was asking some questions. And remember, we asked her the question, well, well, who's the lady, who's the person, who's the salesperson for this? And that lady, whose name was Hollings or something like that, was in this building. They never called her on that receipt. They didn't have to call her, but we know she was here because Brenda Vimage told us about that. We also learned something else about these gloves. That even an extra large, there's probably three different sizes. There's the undersize, the standard, and the oversize. And it depends what lot you get. That's what it boils down to, ladies and gentlemen. We know that. That makes sense, doesn't it? And so when you look at everything regarding... Uh, these gloves. By the way, the lady's name was Helena Phipps, P-H-I-P-P-S. She was in the courthouse and, of course, was never called by the prosecution. She was the actual sales clerk. But I think that the important thing about these gloves that Mr. Rubin was helped us with, in a couple of the pictures of the photographs of the gloves, Mr. Simpson obviously had a heat pack on his hands inside the gloves. You could see the heat pack. If you lived in cold weather, you know about that. And try though they will about shrinking and they're going to show you gee it's raining out there and they're doing all those things isn't that preposterous about uh, they'll do anything to try to contort and distort the facts try to get away from that tactical mistake showing you and the gloves didn't fit so spend all this time on that and the gloves still don't fit Reuben can't help you Reuben is biased can't find those gloves because OJ Simpson's never had those gloves for them to say otherwise is rank speculation. Now this is interesting because Mr. Darden started off by saying, well, you know, we're going to put together this other piece. It's not really one of the elements of uh, the crime of murder uh, motive, but we're going to talk to you about motive now. We're going to tell you and convince you about the motive in this case. And then he spent a long time trying to do that. As I said, he did a fine job and trying to address the facts and conjure up a lot of emotion. But you notice how at the end he kind of petered out of steam there, and I'm sure he got tired, but petered out because this fuse he kept talking about kept going out. It never blew up, it never exploded. There was no triggering mechanism. 
There was nothing that would lead you to that. It was a nice analogy. It was almost like that baby analogy of the baby justice in the house of fire. You don't have to go through any house of fire. You just have to keep your eyes on the prize. And the prize is justice. It's a city called justice, and it's a journey that you're leading toward. That's all you got to do. And so, this is what this is all about. It's evidence of other crimes. And the court, Mr. Darden kind of looked at this and said, oh, Julie, Judge, well, whatever limited purpose. But let's talk about the limited purpose for which all of his argument was about. When they talk about this evidence of other crimes, such evidence was received, excuse me, sir, and may be considered by you only for the limited purpose of determining if it tends to show a characteristic method or plan or scheme about identity or motive. For the limited purpose for which you may consider such evidence, you must weigh it in the same manner as you do all other evidence in the case. You are not permitted to consider such evidence for any other purpose. So this isn't about character assassination of O.J. Simpson, which you might think at first blush. This is about Mr. Darden trying to conjure up a motive for you. And at the outset, let me say that no, none, not one little bit of domestic violence is tolerable between a man and a woman. O.J. Simpson is not proud of that 1989 incident. He's not proud of it. But you know what? He paid his debt to that. He went to court. He went through those, that program. And the one good thing, and no matter how long Darden talked, from 1989 to now, there's never any physical violence between O.J. Simpson and Nicole Brown Simpson. And those are the facts. He kept going back and forth to 85, 89, <coughs> 93. But there's no physical violence. In fact, let's look at the incidents that he talked about just quickly. And keep this in mind, this is supposedly limit for the limited purpose of determining if it tends to show a common scheming plan, identity, or motive. Only for that limited purpose. So keep that in mind. He didn't bother reading all this to you. Let me read you something else again that goes along with this as we consider this evidence. The court's already instructed you about motive. And I listened very carefully as my friend read this. He got to one part and he stopped, but I want to read you the rest of it. Motive is not an element of the crime charged and need not be shown. However, you may consider motive or lack of motive as a circumstance in this case. Presence of motive may tend to establish guilt. He stopped after that last night. Let me read you the rest of it. Absence of motive may tend to establish innocence. You will therefore give its presence or absence as the case may be, the weight to which you feel or find it is entitled. Now, I want to and read you the part about absence of motive in this case. Because as long as he stood up here and tried to talk to you, couldn't show any physical violence after 1989. You could talk about 1985, the incident involving the Mercedes. Simpson wasn't arrested then. He can talk about 1993. And certainly, you would hate to think that two people could have an argument like that, but there was no physical violence. In fact, the police came out, if you recall, and did some further taping. These people were upset and they were arguing, but they never fought on this occasion. They never, there were no blows on this occasion. And certainly no one wants you, if you think in your background, would not want your worst argument ever tape recorded. O.J. Simpson had perhaps his worst argument tape recorded. And then he had the audacity to stand up here and say, well, they didn't call Lenore Walker. We didn't call Lenore Walker because it wasn't necessary. They could have called her. He talked about me, her having some tests that showed that Mr. Simpson was not antisocial, had no antisocial personality. That wasn't true. Why didn't he call her? Because you don't have to call all witnesses. Just like he said, at some point, all of us, I think, got the message. There are certain horrors of sequestration. I dare say, we could still be trying this case. Left to our own devices. Somebody had to have some good sense in this courtroom. We had to bring this matter to a close. We did 
what we set out to do to demonstrate to you reasonable doubt we think we've done that we could call a lot more witnesses that I talked to you about in opening statement but I don't think that's necessary another word about opening statement in opening statement I stood before you and I told you this is what we expect to show this is not evidence that was in January this is what I would hope the evidence would show if there's a witness that I didn't feel was credible or we didn't feel was credible I wouldn't call that witness if there's a witness who was not available we wouldn't call that witness if we didn't feel a witness was necessary we wouldn't call that witness the defense doesn't have to prove anything we've done that in this case prove things however but we don't have to prove anything so the witness wasn't called don't hold that against OJ Simpson you hold that against me and I don't think you can hold that against me because the defendant doesn't have to prove anything and remember the judge has already instructed you as follows let me read it to you again so we make this clear hey Mr. Darden will remember this the prosecution has the burden of proving beyond a reasonable doubt each element of the crimes charged in the information and that the defendant was a perpetrator of any such crimes such charged crimes the defendant is not required to prove himself innocent or to prove that another person committed the crimes charged. Well, that law is not just for O.J. Simpson. That's the law of the state of California for everyone. And they know it. I told you at the beginning, in this search for truth, in your courage, we cannot let them turn the Constitution on its head. I am going to be your reminder of that. So continuing on, he talks about what might sound like character assassination over and over again about these incidents of controlling and jealous rage. And just because he says that, supposedly makes it so. Isn't it interesting? 17 years these folks were married. Had two beautiful kids, a beautiful life. Think they had any good times together? Think they ever want to talk about any of the good times? Think about even after 93. Remember, they got a divorce in their chart in 1992. But they tried to get back together. Dr. Christian Reichardt told you. It wasn't O.J. Simpson. It was Nicole Brown Simpson who asked to get back together in 1993. They tried to work it out for about a year. They didn't live together, but they tried to work it out. They talked about this. They tried to date exclusively. They tried to salvage a 17-year marriage. And you could understand that. It was her idea. It didn't work out. And they went their separate ways. The evidence is he'd been dating Paula Barberi back in 1992 for almost a year. But when he got back with his wife in April or May of 93, he stopped dating her. When he broke up with his wife again, he started dating her again. He wanted to give it a fair shot. And Barnell Simpson said he would wake up sometimes in the morning and Miss Nicole Brown Simpson would be over there with the kids at the house this was during this period of time. They were trying to get back and get along. They all went to Cabo San Lucas. They had a good life together. It's interesting how the prosecution doesn't want to talk about that at all. In their cynical view of life, they took two or three incidents and say, this just tells us the whole picture. Well, all of us, all of us, there's more to the entire picture. And I ask you rhetorically this question, who would know O.J. Simpson better? His mother Eunice, his sister Shirley, his sister Carmelita, his daughter Arnell, or Marsha Clark and Chris Darden? Who do you think knows him when they sit up here and talk about his public persona and he's got this dark side? Those are all just words. He's a human being and he's not perfect. He's not proud of some of the things he did. But they don't add up to murder. There's no escalation of force and violence throughout 1989. It's not there. We don't have to call a Nora Walker. Your common sense tells you this. And then he goes into this kind of make-believe fantasy world where he's going to try to tell you on June 12th, he's going to conjure up this rage. June 12th. Very interesting day, isn't it? It's wonderful 
that we live in the age of videotape. Because he tells you about how O.J. Simpson was. Cindy Garvey was telling you how O.J. Simpson was. He was going to be this mean, dark, brooding person at this, at this concert. That he was going to kill his ex-wife because he didn't like his seats. I guess that was what it was about, that he didn't like his seats or because he didn't invite her to dinner. I mean, can you imagine that? That's how silly what they're talking about is in this case, as he tries to play out this drama. But let me show you. Rather than talk, a picture is worth a thousand words. So let me show you this video. You watch this video for a moment, and we'll talk about it. This is for Chris Darden. Uh, you'll recognize some of the people in this photograph after a while. There's Mr. Simpson kissing Denise Brown, kissing Ms. Juditha Brown, it's Mr. Lewis Brown. Talking to a friend. And that's his son Justin, whom he kisses. I'm smiling and happily waving. Mr. Brown's happy. Laughing, falling down, laughing again, bending over laughing. Now you see that. You see that with your own eyes. You'll have that back in that jury room. How does that comport with this tortured, twisted reasoning that he was angry in some kind of a jealous rage? He's in a jealous rage like that to you? Your eyes aren't lying to you when you see that. Thank heaven we have videotape. I didn't tell you about that in opening statement. You think that's pretty compelling? Thank heaven we have that. And we know in this city how important videotapes can be when people don't want to believe things, even when they see it on videotapes. And you saw that yourself. So when you're back there, somebody tries to tell you there was some kind of jealous rage on June 12th, look at O.J. Simpson interacting with the Brown family and everyone else. Doesn't fit, doesn't make any sense. He isn't brooding, he's not angry, he kisses these family members, he's laughing and joking, he's playing with his son Justin. Those are the facts, not what I made up. These are items that don't fit. And if you want to go a little bit further, let's talk about what we know about him that evening. That video is what, about six o'clock in the evening? Let's start at six o'clock on June 12th. We know he had a good day that day. He had a good week. We'll talk about part of the week and her demeanor, but let's just talk about that part of the evening. Six o'clock, he's at that recital. You know, you go to a recital because you're proud of your child. You know, and if these recitals, and you all can think back, and those of you who don't have kids will live for this day, you know, these programs are long. If your child is like 33 or 34th on the program. You love everybody else's child, but sometimes you don't want to sit there doing the whole thing, you know. We're told some stuff about he moved a chair around. You ever been in an auditorium where you can move chairs around? Most auditorium seats are like those. You can't move those seats around. This is preposterous. Mr. Darden wasn't in that auditorium. And even after that video, like any proud papa, you know what O.J. Simpson did? Took a picture, a photograph, with his daughter. Let's look at this photograph for a minute. You want to see how he looks while he's in this murderous rage, while this fuse is going on that Darden talks about? Where's the fuse now, Mr. Darden? Where's the fuse? Look at that look on his face. Like any proud papa, he's proud of that little girl. And who wouldn't be proud of her? This is post the dance recital. She has the flowers. Apparently he went out and bought for her. He's standing there with her. The photograph's taken. There's no way of knowing. He would have no way of knowing that would be important. He'd have no way of knowing that Chris Darden someday would stand before you and try to make you believe that that man was in a murderous rage at that same time and that we would bring forward that picture so you would see it with your own eyes so you'd understand. What exhibit is that, Mr. Douglas, sir? Look on the back of it. Oh, it's a smaller one. 
Okay. We'll get that for you. So thank heaven again for the visual. A photograph is worth a thousand words. So he could speak a thousand words and I could show you one photograph. He could speak a thousand more words and I can show you that video. And what it does is it puts the lie to this theory about some kind of murderous race. But we don't just stop there. We didn't just stop there. But this is serious business. A man's life is at stake. So what do we do? We talk to Gigi Guerin, his housekeeper. O.J. Simpson, by and large, has a great relationship with all the women in his life. And you've met a number of them. Gigi Guerin is the housekeeper. So she came in here and the great witness said that she was at Knott's Berry Farm on June 12th. She's out with her family. And at 8 o'clock, she wanted to stay over because she's due to come home that evening. She said, can I stay over? And Mr. Simpson says, yes, you may. And so I asked her, how did he sound to you? He sounded like Mr. O.J. Simpson always sounds. The employer that she knows, the relationship that she has with him. You saw her. You observed her. You saw her go through cross-examination. She seemed believable to you? Eight o'clock? I think so. I think you'll find so. And then we know that at nine o'clock, he talked to Christian Reichardt, his friend, Dr. Christian Reichardt. And you saw Chris Reichardt come in here and talk to you. I thought he made a very, very, very good witness from a standpoint of what he had to say. He told you that O.J. Simpson sounded even happier than usual. He's more jovial. He got his life back together and he was moving on. Now, isn't that interesting? Isn't that an interesting way of looking at circumstantial evidence? Let me show you how, how we differ in this case. The doctor witness comes in and says O.J. Simpson is jovial at 9 o'clock on June 12th. Pretty good evidence, wouldn't you say? I think you'd love to have that. Anybody would in the case where you're supposedly in a murderous rage. Instead of Chris Darden standing here and saying, well, you know, that's pretty tough evidence for us to overcome. He says, O.J. Simpson was happy because he was going to kill his wife. Now, if you believe that, I suppose I might as well sit down now and I'm probably wasting my time. I don't think any of you believe that. That is preposterous. It flies in the face of everything that is reasonable. If you have these two reasonable hypotheses, his isn't even reasonable. But extremely reasonable. You'd have to adopt this, that he's jovial, he's happy. They make a date for that next Wednesday when O.J. Simpson returns from back east. You remember that? That's the testimony. Now, Mr. Darden tries to make a big thing of the fact, well, gee, you know, golly, um, was he depressed about the fact that they had broken up or they have finally broken up? He said, yeah, he'd been down. I don't think he never said he was depressed, that he was down or upset. And who wouldn't be? Remember the last questions I asked? If you... It just ended a 17-year relationship. It was over. You feel down. For a short period of time, you got your life on. You wouldn't go kill your ex-wife, the mother of your children. O.J. Simpson didn't try to kill or didn't kill Nicole Brown Simpson when they got a divorce, when they went through whatever settlement they went through, when Faye Resnick moved in, when any of these things, none of these things happened. But because of their rush to judgment, they have to try to come up with some kind of a motive it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't stop with just Christian Reichardt and what he had to say. And of course, I have his testimony also about what he said. He talked about the demeanor of the various people he talked about. But most importantly, he talked about O.J. Simpson's demeanor and how it was that night and how he appeared to be. Let me just read you this part here. This is 42537 Council. Question. Now, with regard to the statement about whether or not you talked about Ms. Nicole Brown Simpson, that was not the thrust of any of that conversation, was it? Answer, not at all. She wasn't on his mind. This time he's talking about getting ready to go to McDonald's. In fact, do you recall that Mr. Simpson had said that to you that he was out of the loop? That he was glad to be out of the loop, that he'd gotten his life together with his new lady? Remember him telling you that? Answer, that's correct. And who was that new lady 
answer Paula Barbieri. Let me just take a moment about Paula Barbieri. One of the most outrageous things I heard yesterday was this, specul this wild speculation that O.J. Simpson had, had some kind of falling out with Paula Barbieri on that Sunday. Where is the evidence of that? I mean, that's preposterous. The evidence is quite to the contrary. Remember when O.J. Simpson came back into town on Friday? First person who met him and they spent the evening together was Paula Barbieri. And it was interesting because I, I was having trouble listening, hearing her. She said, I stayed at the house till one of you reminded me, she said, till I went to the prayer meeting. It's where she left. They'd been together that day. And then, on the very next day, they went to this, this dinner in support of Israel. And I guess Mr. Douglas can show us that. This is that dinner. I guess he's really working up that murderous rage that day with those little ladies that he's with. They seem to be really happy to be taking a picture with him. Had no idea we'd ever have to use this to show, to counterbalance this specious, cynical, speculative theory that he's had some kind of a time fuse. But that photograph, again, demonstrates that. And then we have the testimony of the lady who was there, Carol Connor, about what she called that exquisite moment. And I suppose that she's an artist. Uh, you can tell by the way she was dressed when she's here, and she's written this Academy Award winning love tune. And I guess she sees things maybe that we don't quite see, but she said it was an exquisite moment between O.J. Simpson and Paula Barberi as they were in each other's arms at that particular dinner. Remember she told you that. Was, it, was he thinking about Nicole at that point? Only in Chris Darden's mind. Not in yours, not anything else reasonable. And so you have, again, these photographs and these word pictures, which I think amply destroys this. So, he continues on about Paula Barbieri. He says, you knew about Paula Barbieri, isn't that correct? Yes, I did. Also, Mr. Simpson had told you that he began dating Paula Barbieri on a regular basis, isn't that correct? Answer, yeah. And that you had said and indicated to the police in an interview that Mr. Simpson seemed to like Paula a lot and seem happy, or at least happier, than he had been before once he was with Paula. Isn't that correct? That's correct, yes. That's what you told the police, isn't it, sir? That's correct. When you talk to the police, Dr. Reichardt, Reichard, were you telling them the truth? Answer, absolutely. And when you are coming here today to testify to this jury, are you telling them the truth? Answer, absolutely. And so, once again, I haven't tried to speculate. I've read to you what the witness said. Now, now what about this thing that the Darden keeps talking about that he knows isn't so, that the police have been out there eight times on so-called domestic discord cases. They tell you that a whole bunch of times. And this is why you have to look with some suspicion at what the prosecutors tell you in this case. You remember, remember Officer Farrell? The officer who was a sergeant, I believe, who after the 89 incident went back to the station to try and check and see whether or not there had ever been any other incidents where any of the police officers in that division in West Los Angeles had been called. You check your notes. And so what he did was he had occasion to check for other domestic discord incidents. This becomes rather important later as you're going to see. So he talks to us, he says, the question is, all right, so you talk to some officers. How many? Just tell me in number, how many officers did you talk to altogether? Answer, I can't recall. Maybe 10. And did you take any reports from any of those officers? Answer, I requested if they had any information to write out a report and give it to me. Question, and you got a report from one officer, did you not? Answer, that's correct. Question, and that officer's name is... Mark Furman. Question. That's correct. And was that the only written report that you received? So now, when Darren stands up here and talks to you about these eight incidents or whatever where the, there's nothing happened, they checked with at least ten of the police officers in that division. Nobody had any recollection of anything of going out there. Now we know from ship the police would stop by there. We know that. Ship told us that. There's some photograph and evidence of O.J. Simpson with Ship and maybe some other police officers. That was a place they would stop by on occasion. 
But this, eight, to tell you eight to ten times, they know that was their own witness, Sparrow. Then he has the audacity to tell you about stalking. He tells you an opening statement. He's going to tell you and show you O.J. Simpson was stalking Nicole Brown Simpson. Now, this is the prosecutor. He proved one incident of stalking? Absolutely not. In fact, yesterday, when he stood up here and told you about O.J. Simpson looking in the window of Nicole Brown Simpson's house, I was somewhat dismayed. So, I thought, gee, I better get the transcript out again. Since the record is the best evidence, not what they say. Because they say it so, isn't so. They said that themselves. And so we talked about this. And you remember Mr. Colby? Colby and Co. Two people who live next door to Nicole on Gretna Green. Remember them? You remember those two. And he, Mr. Colby was testifying on this date. It's counsel, it's 13176. I saw, I saw him observe the residence next door, then walk around the corner, which would be southerly, then westerly on Shetland, and go back around again and look again at the residence. Well, let me just stop you there, all right, so that it is clear. When you first saw the man who was on the sidewalk five feet from Nicole Brown's driveway, there's an objection. Yes, then he walked in a southerly direction, then back around the corner. Our house is on a corner like this, indicating. He then went southerly and then westerly and then back around again. Okay. Did he walk back to the same spot he was in when you saw him initially? Yes, he did. And he goes on to talk about him walking within five yards of Nicole Brown Simpson's driveway and then walks back. And you remember this was the incident where the Mr. Colby said he was embarrassed because he saw this black man in Brentwood and he called the police. And then he found out it was O.J. Simpson. Now nowhere are you going to find in that testimony O.J. Simpson was up looking in a window or stalking anybody. He was on the sidewalk out there, presumably waiting for his wife or the kids to come home, and then he left. That's how the people have twisted and turned things in this case. That becomes his incident of stalking. And when you go back, you look at this evidence, and you, I know you're going to be fair and honorable, you look at this and you'll see. You'll make short work of this. You'll make short work of an emotional argument. It was very emotional. But it doesn't add up. It doesn't fit. It wasn't factual. It's for a limited purpose. And here may be the coup de grace. All of these things are supposedly for motive to show how somebody might have acted on June 12. Interesting, isn't it? Again, in the words of Shakespeare, they are hoisted by their own petard. They talk about these incidents involving Nicole and Mr. O.J. Simpson, every time they would have an argument, everybody would know about it, whether it was in 89 or the 93. They would, everybody would know about it because it would be loud, it would be arguing back and forth. There was drinking on the time in 89, January 1st, remember what the evidence was? They'd both been drinking. It certainly doesn't make it right, but they were loud arguments where everybody knew about it. What kind of characteristic is that in this case? This is a case about stealth. This is a case about somebody who it seems to me is a professional assassin who kills these two people. And the thing that is so outrageous, for them to stand here and tell you that this is, this is all about Nicole Brown Simpson. Have any of you thought during the last year, what if the perpetrators were after Ron Goldman and that envelope that he had in his hand that Dr. Lee found that smear on? Who in this courtroom would know. The rest is speculation. This is their theory that they tried to come up with. We don't know. This is a case of reasonable doubt. This is a case of an innocent man wrongfully accused. They can't answer those questions. No one can under these circumstances. And so we move on and look at other things that don't fit. We know that there was this terrific struggle involving primarily Mr. Golan, Mr. Goldman as he fought for his life. Why no bruises on Mr. Simpson's body here? Admittedly, this was a violent struggle involving two very, very fit adults. And let's look briefly at the bruises on Mr. Goldman's hands. I don't think we have to cut the feet on this, Your Honor, I don't believe. 
We talked about this in the opening statement. We had a large bruise on the knuckle. According to Dr. Baden and others, it's consistent with Mr. Goldman's fight that he put up for his life. He struck something, probably a person at that point. But Ms. Clark and the others can't even admit that. In the face of doctors, a doctor who did the re-autopsy, re-examination of the death involving Martin Luther King and John F. Kennedy tells you one thing. The prosecutors say, oh, no, no, it must have been, he must have been flailing back, must have hit his hand against a tree or something like that. Only the facts that they want to put into this little contorted theory. But we prove to you otherwise. We prove to you what's reasonable under the circumstances. So I think you saw that in my opening, and I think that is further evidence this was a very, very real fight. And of course, in a real fight, in real life, fights are awkward and clumsy. Oftentimes, the combatants are rolling around on the ground. And one of the very interesting things in this case is this dugout area near Mr. Goldman's body. <laughs> I feed you because. This area, I thought, was very, very interesting. Remember, I asked Detective Lang about this, and this is going to become very, very important later on. See this area, this dugout area? Remember, there's the pager over there, and there's this dugout area. That gives you some idea of the ferocity of this altercation that took place. Remember Dr. Henry Lee talked about the blood all around in this area, the keys one place, the beeper someplace else. This dugout area. Interesting, isn't it? Now think with me for a moment. If you fought for five to 15 minutes in an area like that, I suppose both parties would have a lot of bruises and marks on them, wouldn't they? Mr. Goldman did, and I bet you his perpetrator does. But there's something else, again. They want to tell you, and you hear a lot about socks before we're finished, that these socks, these socks that all of a sudden appear to that video, the foot of his bed, were being worn by Mr. O.J. Simpson. Well, ladies and gentlemen, when you see these socks, what do you think the dirt and dust was on these socks? Now, let's see if they can ever explain this. Where was the dirt? It was thrown up and moved around on these socks. You're not going to see any. You're not going to see any dirt because those socks weren't there. You see that dirt? You see that dugout? You remember this photograph. What number is this, Mr. Douglas? You remember this. When you talk about this case and you wonder whether or not there's a reasonable doubt, whether or not this is an innocent man wrongfully accused. And so you look at this. When you expect, common sense would tell you. There'd be bruises and nicks being kicked. There'd be marks on all the perpetrators. With the heavy foliage there, with the fence and the trees, you would expect scratches on everyone. Whereas Mr. Goldman has more than 30 stab wounds, you would expect this struggle, 5 to 15 minutes, to have left that. But there's nothing like that in this case. Nothing like that on Mr. Simpson's body. You've seen that before and you'll see it again. Now, in this case, Exhibit 1249, Your Honor. Thank you. In this case, in opening statement, I showed you with Bob Shapiro's foresight and wisdom, he had these photographs taken, I think on June 15. Instead of praising this lawyer who was interested in the truth, prosecution says, well, they went to Dr. Heisinger. That wasn't really his doctor. Isn't that preposterous? Dr. Heisinger, by all accounts, is a qualified doctor. He was the Raiders team doctor. So I suppose he's qualified. And this is Mr. O.J. Simpson's body as it appeared on June 15th. Wouldn't you expect to see a lot of bruises and marks on that body? He's back. Some of these aren't very flattering, but this is not about flattery. This is about his life.
Now on his hands. There's some slight abrasions on his hands, but nothing consistent with a fight like this. You know it. I know it. We all know it. And we'll talk more about this, this so-called fish hook cut and where he got that. It'll become very clear when we talk about demeanor, where that came from. Ms. Clark wants to try to confuse that, but that's very, very clear. And so with regard to Mr. Simpson's physical condition, I want to just tell you to take my word to stand there and say, oh, he, had, he was in great shape on that day or he looked good or whatever. Fortunately, we had photographs again. We had graphic evidence of this man's body. This man had not been in a life and death struggle from five to 15 minutes. Ms. Clark herself said it. She used a boxing analogy, saying that a boxer's fight for three minutes per round. Sometimes it's a knockout in the first round. But in this instance, we know because of the way the injuries were and the blood, this lasted for this period of time. This was a violent struggle. That man that you saw up there was not involved in that violent struggle. And so we did call, Bob Shapiro called Dr. Robert Heisinger. as a witness in this case, and you recall that Dr. Heisinger was a very, very, uh, seemed to me a very credible, honest witness. What did he say? He said that O.J. Simpson looks like Tarzan. But he moves more like Tarzan's grandfather. That's not to say that O.J. Simpson wouldn't be capable of committing a crime. It's never what we were trying to say. What we were trying to say was that see this man for who he is. See this man for the arthritis that he suffers. That everybody in his family suffers with arthritis. You saw his mother. You heard his sister. And you heard he has it worse than they have. Now he can still play golf. You can still do that. And some of you, I hope, don't. But if you have in the early stages, you know what it is, certainly on certain days. What I think it means is you don't go out looking for anybody to be in an altercation with. O.J. Simpson, by all accounts, has trouble with lateral movement from moving side to side because you saw when I had him come over here, those knee operations that basically spelled NFL, National Football League, four or five times on the left knee, maybe a couple times on the right knee. That's the price that a running back pays, plays. And while I'm talking about running backs, wasn't it interesting yesterday that Ms. Clark in our argument says O.J. Simpson was a football player and he has to run through the line and he has the killer instinct. Now, is that really stretching it, ladies and gentlemen? O.J. Simpson hasn't played football for 15 years. Man's 46 years old now. He's not going to run with anything anymore. But she doesn't know much about sports, does she? Because a running back avoids trying to be hit. It's what he does. The problem with them, they don't block. They always run. They try to get out of the way. So he's not, he's not looking for contact. He gets tackled. But running backs don't try to run over anybody, only like maybe Jim Brown or somebody like that. The rest of them run out of bounds. So I mean, they, they grab at everything. Killer instinct. Played football 15 years ago, and he was the best at what he did. He won the Heisman Trophy, according to his daughter, the day she was born. Emblematic of the best football player in America. And so, this was brought to you only to give you some further factors about who this man is, what limitations, if any, he has, to give you a complete picture of who he is. Now we shift our attention to Mr. O.J. Simpson's demeanor, and I want you to examine with me the conduct both before and after June 12th, 1994, and the manner in which this man reacted and handled himself. You'll remember, and let's start off with the week before. We could have gone further back. You know from the evidence that he travels all the time. He hardly has any time to have any fuse for anything. He's never here. He's always traveling for Hertz. He's doing something with sports. He's not here. This particular week was typical of the kind of weeks he has, it seems. He was here on Monday. On Tuesday, he and Paula Barbieri got together and met with this interior designer who'd done work on his house before. She brought out that he's done other work on that house to change the bathroom around and do some other work. She had a budget and they gave her a check. Now, it's so interesting, isn't it? You change your house or get some work done. Mr. Darden says that's to get Nicole out of the house. Is that stupid? I mean, does that make any sense to you? That's preposterous. Man's moved on with his life. He's having some work done, some interior decorating work done. We prove that. 
You can't see the positive side of that. O.J. Simpson, a check for Collins and Collins. It was Mary Collins. June 7th, $1,000. That was a down payment on the work she was going to do. I mean, again, you saw her. You saw her come in. This work was to be done. They wanted to do it. And Paula Barberi played a role and a great part in that work. After that, he was on the road. Went back east to play golf with Jack McKay. And you saw Jack McKay. And you remember they were golf buddies. It was a Hertz thing or not a Hertz thing. This was this association of a retired or something or other. Play golf. But the most important thing I thought was Mr. McKay indicated that, and there was the foursome, Mr. McKay indicated that he observed Mr. Simpson walking and walking with a limp. You'll recall that. And then we came to the Carol Connor dinner the, where Carol Connor observed the magic moment on this Saturday. And then we call witnesses from the family. Now, any daughter would be proud and want to testify for her father. But you saw her on the stand. You got a chance to judge her like you do the other witnesses, to observe her credibility and what she had to tell you. She told you that her father always rushed around. Told you something about him too. And when she got out of college at Howard University, she wanted to come home. He had a place for her to come home to. You know, children go away and they come back a lot these days. And so, uh, Cato Kalin, they make a big thing about Cato Kalin living there. I mean, you know, I choose to think, say something about O.J. Simpson. You don't know Cato Kalin anything. If he wanted to say, look, I don't want you living with my wife. We're trying to get back together. I suppose a guy could say that if they're trying to get back together. He didn't say that. Let him come and live there in the other guest house. They turned that around to something bad. That's something positive about this man who with such dignity has sat there for all these months. This human being, this Orenthal James Simpson. That tells you something about him. And so his daughter tells you a lot about him. She can tell a lot about a person, I suppose, by their children. She tells you a lot about him and their living together and their life together and what he meant. About how her little brothers and sisters would come over there in the early morning hours after they were trying to get together in 1994 in May. They'd be out by the pool. She'd see them. But the kind of life they had together and the dogs that they purchased and the kind of things they did. Maybe a little bit of the other side. What these incidents they want to talk about in the distant past. The way O.J. Simpson really is and really was. You saw her and you observed her. And she told you how her father reacted when he got the news that his ex-wife had been killed. She told you. She had never before heard her father sound like that. How upset he was. How he lost control of himself. How distraught he was. You heard her. You saw her on that stand. That's why we called her. So you'd have a better understanding because we knew, I knew there'd come a day that Marsha Clark would stand here and say, well, you know, he didn't react like somebody does when they get this information. Just like she did yesterday. But what Miss Clark forgot, because I examined Detective Phillips, and you look back through your notes. The first thing that O.J. Simpson said to Detective Phillips was, what do you mean she's been killed? And then he kept repeating himself and repeating himself. And Phillips, to his credit, said he became very, very upset, kept repeating himself. And Phillips gave the phone to Arnell Simpson. So they can make, she can, she can, again, theorize, fantasize all she wants. Well, he didn't ask it was a car accident. You ever had... Some bad news given to you. There's no book that you go to. The only book you should go to is the Bible or your God, whomever you believe in, to help get you through it. There's nothing that says how you would handle yourself in those times. These prosecutors don't understand that. They would stand here and tell you that that's preposterous. This man was upset. And you're going to see that everything he did from that moment that he found out that his ex-wife had been killed was consistent only with innocence. Absolutely that day. And so Arnell Simpson helps us in that regard. She's followed to the stand by Kamala Durio. Sister, loves her brother, but you knew that. She was called to talk about Ron Ship. One of the witnesses in this case of the prosecution call. 
It's interesting, isn't it? That neither one of the prosecutors wanted to talk about this dream, because I think they're embarrassed by this. They didn't talk about it. They should be embarrassed. A dream. They elicited evidence about some dream. Was it a daydream? Was it a night dream? Was it a nightmare? Was he looking out the window? What does it mean? Even the judge, his, his instruction. You can totally disregard that. If you've you got to figure out, I mean, who knows what that means? It probably doesn't mean anything because Ship did not tell you the truth. If you listen to Carmelita, if you listen to Shirley, if you listen to Miss Eunice Simpson, Ship was never alone with O.J. Simpson that night. He's an O.J. wannabe, bringing police officers over there, still wanting to be a police officer, off the force for whatever reason, drinking that night, drinking in the past as he said he was. He's not credible, and the evidence he brings is so unreliable and so irrelevant that I don't want to spend much of your time with it. But you saw it, you heard then. I ask you to consider Carmelita, Shirley, and Eunice as against Ron Ship, and you, I ask you who you're going to believe. I think it'll be no contest. And so you remember what Miss Eunice Simpson said when she said that he seemed a bit spacey was the way she described it. He was never alone, never talked about any dreams. When, when Shirley went upstairs with her husband, they spent the night with O.J. Simpson. This was a time for family. This was a time where people gathered around. This is a time for people being sad. They sat on the couch with O.J. Simpson holding his mother's hand. You remember that. My mother always told me that you could tell a lot about a person, about how they treat their mother. You probably have heard that too. And your mother is the one who always comes for you and to you in times of tragedy and stress. True to those words, there was Eunice Simpson as she is this very day. Right there by her son's side, sitting on that couch. Who are you going to believe? Eunice Simpson or Ron Ship, this wannabe? I submit that you're going to believe Eunice Simpson. She knows her boy. He knows his mother. And then, each of these witnesses who dealt with O.J. Simpson, and let me just quickly come to and we'll get a logical breaking point so you can get to your dinner. Alan Park, who she puts such great credence in, found O.J. Simpson to be, his demeanor to be normal. You never met him before. He was a normal guy. He was glad to be carrying O.J. Simpson around. The only thing he said was interesting. He said, you know, he, was, he said he was hot in the back. Now, O.J. Simpson himself said he was hot in the back of the car. And I thought about this today, and this morning when I was rushing around, trying to get dressed and come to court today to look forward to seeing you all again for another year and a day. I took a shower and I was trying to get dressed and I, I, I kept sweating, I kept sweating. And I thought about how that applies to this case, because you know we talk about common sense. You ever rush around and take a shower and you're sweating? O.J. Simpson always rushes around, according to his daughter, according to Gigi. Those are the kind of common sense things we know. And so, when we come back this afternoon, we're going to talk about Cato Kalin and how he found O.J. Simpson to be the same O.J. Simpson. And we're going to talk about a range of people who see this man from 11 o'clock on till the next morning till he comes back. We'll take them one at a time, but they all have one thing in common. It's O.J. Simpson, and he's acting normally. He's himself, not acting. And the thing that I think is probably best, and there are a number of good witnesses in that regard, but Howard Bingham is a well-known person around here, and let me end on this point. Howard Bingham gets on the plane, and he... It was funny because he was in coach and he wanted to try to explain that to you why he was sitting back there in coach and O.J. was in first class. And he sees O.J. and he runs up there to say hello to him before the plane takes off, remember? And I asked him, well, how did O.J. Simpson seem to you this evening? He said, it was the same O.J. I've always seen and known. And so rhetorically I ask you again, Howard Bingham, 
in this area for years, known O.J. for years? Who do you think knows O.J. Simpson better? Howard Bingham or Marsha Clark and Chris Darden? When we come back, we'll answer that question. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take our recess for the uh, afternoon. Please remember all my admonitions to you. We'll stand in recess until 6 o'clock. All right, have a pleasant evening meal. And Joe Hines, this is a very accomplished trial lawyer that we're going to see here. No question. And, and you know, it's good literature, too. The, the, you know, he, he understands the majesty of language. He understands the need to entertain. And however tacky that sounds, entertainment is very, very important in summations. So I think both of us were amazed that, that, that you're allowed to, uh, to talk about the law yeah. in California. You would get murdered yeah. in, in New York State if you ever tried to do that. Why? What's the I thought I was in Mars uh, when I was hearing Marsha Clark mm -hmm. explaining and detailing the distinction between murder two and murder one. Mm -hmm. And in New York, in federal court, in most jurisdictions that I'm familiar with, that's the province of the court and the court alone. You know, we see that yeah. in California cases, yeah. though. Yeah. Uh, Leslie Abramson, I think, hung that jury by yeah. emphasizing mm -hmm. the circumstantial well, evidence I, when, case. When Judge Ito uh, decided a motion against the prosecution before the, uh, the uh, Johnny Cochran started, uh, th there was a detailed discussion about this chart that uh, Blazer said he's used for five years. And Judge Ito said, matter of fact, like, yeah, I've seen that chart before. It's okay. And it was an explanation about, you know, <laughs> burden of proof and reasonable doubt. And I said to my, to, uh, to, uh, my wife, that, I said, well, you ever tried that in one of our courtrooms? They throw you out. All right. Well, that's yeah. part of the different trial culture in California. They are back in session. We'll go back for more of Johnny Cochran's summation. Ladies and gentlemen, it is strange to say that, but I appreciate your uh, hanging in there. A little chilly? Okay. All right, Mr. Cochran, you may uh, continue with your closing argument. Thank you, Your Honor. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad you all came back. I uh, appreciate that. <laughs> oh, I guess so. <laughs> now, where were we when we left off? We were talking about demeanor uh, Mr. Simpson's demeanor and I think I had posed a question with you just before we took our break about Howard Bingham the photographer who testified here and I ask you the question a rhetorical question about who would know OJ Simpson the better in his mood and how he appeared on this night the prosecutors or Mr. Bingham who'd known him for such a long time it was a serious question because prosecutors I presume never met Mr. Simpson before we started this process. So I think it would be relevant for you to know about how somebody who knew him over a period of time saw him on that particular day. Especially when they go into their doctor mode and they use terms like post-homicidal conduct. Uh, there's been no testimony in this case at all about post-homicidal conduct and about demeanor, about anybody acts uh, in a post-homicidal conduct. That again is more speculation. But what we did in this case was we tried to call for you a number of witnesses who I think bear on this issue of demeanor, which it seems to us is totally relevant. For one thing, it totally rebuts this specious theory about any kind of a fuse or any rage that you've seen. We, we've done that. We, we've shared that with you already. And in the course of wrapping that up, keep in mind that both Cato Kalin and Alan Park fall in to the category of demeanor witnesses who place Mr. Simpson's demeanor as being entirely appropriate. And these are people's witnesses. So it doesn't matter whether we call the witnesses or they do. If you're in a search for truth, you look and see if there's a common thread of truth that runs throughout these witnesses. And I think we found that. Now, one of the things that I wanted to share with you, yesterday, uh, Ms. Clark, in her argument, tried to indicate something to the fact that uh, Mr. Simpson didn't want uh, Cato Kalin, I believe, to um, spend time with him or something of that nature as though he wanted to get rid of Cato Kalin. It was part of her, her theory there. And I went back and I looked at the um, testimony at uh, 19854, Ms. Clark herself, when questioning Cato Kalin. Uh, when you got to that location, what did you do? When I got to the door, yes, I turned. Okay, what did you see? OJ. And where was he? at the driver's side door of the rolls. Did you say anything to him? No. Um, 
what did you do? I looked and said, I'll eat in my room. Uh, and then he went off and to ate in his room. But there was no, further on it says, did you have any conversation with Mr. Simpson? Answer was no. And he said nothing to you. No. So I think that was important to understand and put that record straight, that there was no discussion about whether Cato would go in the house with Mr. Simpson or, or whatever. They didn't talk. Cato went back to his room. Simpson was still out at his uh, Bentley, uh, presumably trying to get ready to you know, go on this trip, which was long planned. Uh, there had been some mention earlier of an argument at a Christmas party. And I wanted to, again, try and set the record straight before we went on with demeanor, because I, I pulled up Cato Kalin's testimony again. And what he says was that after question, did everybody go home together? Answer, yes. Everybody celebrate Christmas Eve back at home? Answer, at Rockingham, yes. Question, Nicole, OJ, and the kids? Answer, yes. Question, and yourself? Answer, and Arnell and Jason? Question, whole family? Yes. Now, what they do is they tell you, well, there was, a, there, was a, there was an argument at the Jenners, and what they don't tell you was, remember the testimony was, they left the Jenners to go back home because it was Christmas Eve, and they all celebrated Christmas Eve together. So you've got to have the whole picture, don't you? Don't you think that seems reasonable? And uh, there was some question about the flashlight, and here's what Cato Kalen had to say about that, where he says, then I said, O.J., do we have a better flashlight? And, and mm, when I told him about the noise, he was going to take one way, I was going to take, go another way. But that is when I said, we have this lousy flashlight, we need another one. And so he, he was going to go inside and check. And then they went in the house, uh, he followed behind. And then that's when Mr. Simpson had to then leave uh, for the airport. Uh, so I think that, again, I, I want to, I promise you, I would always try to read the actual testimony to make it uh, as clear as I could about where we were. A few other housekeeping things before we get directly into the demeanor aspect. Uh, Ms. Clark yesterday had made a number of points about phone calls and boards to Paula Barbieri. And you'll recall we saw a number 305, which I think is in the Miami area code. And I think the, the evidence is that's a cell phone of some kind. And uh, certainly if you call that phone number out here, you can reach people on a cell phone. And I, I find nothing unusual about that uh, in regards to the calls that were made. We, there also was some discussion about what Dr. Batten had had to say about these cuts or cut on Mr. Simpson's hand. You recall that Brian Kilberg came back down here again and he asked some questions of Dr. Baden, and I tried to pull up this testimony so I'd have it clear about when Mr. Simpson had gone to the Bronco to get the portable phone, when he went back to the Bronco to apparently to get the paraphernalia uh, in that phone, and try to piece together as to when he got a small cut on his hand, not any large fish hook cut, which I think was clear from the evidence. At what point that he may have bled inside that Bronco, and may or may not have known that. And so we read Baden. And uh, this is at page 41182. Question by Mr. Kelberg, I believe. What, if anything, did Mr. Simpson have to say as to the manner when he got the cuts? Answer, that he recalls some blood after trying to re retrieve his phone or some material from the Bronco, from a car. From a car that he had his phone. I think it was the Bronco that he'd gone to the Bronco to get something and may have somehow cut himself while getting stuff, stuff from the Bronco to bring with him to Chicago. Well, I think that it's important to tie this in with the fact that, remember that Cato Kalin and I think even Alan Park indicated that by the time they were there, when Mr. Simpson finally came down the stairs, this, 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 when he left, there were bags already down. Certainly the golf bag and this other bag, there were bags already out there. So he'd been outside in that yard and apparently, according to Ms. Clark's testimony, had been at some point out to the Bronco, and at some point he'd gotten this phone, this portable phone. But we know he'd gotten it because he'd made a portable a phone call on that phone by 10 o'clock or by 10.03. Car wasn't moving. This is a portable phone. And remember, I asked Gigi Guerin 
were there any portable phones inside that house? The testimony there were there were none. So there was no wireless telephone at Rockingham. So I think the testimony is and the reasonable inference is that Mr. Simpson made that cell phone from that location to her cell phone number uh, 305 area code. And then once we they left as I told you they left with Park and we know that was around 1102. So now Mr. Simpson's in the car and as you, you know how Park describes O.J. Simpson. Uh, nothing on the ordinary. Uh, he, says, he says he's hot but that's nothing unusual. And then Mr. Simpson gets to the airport. Do you remember those two young men who came in? Michael Norris and Michael Gladden. And these are the two airport couriers who were parked at the curb there and one of them, Gladden, wanted to get Mr. Simpson's autograph. You'll recall that. And so, even though Mr. Simpson was rushed and trying to get to the plane or whatever, he stopped and he gave his uh, O.J. Simpson peace to you. Uh, that was a signature that he gave uh, at about, I think the testimony was, 11.20, 11.25, that particular night on June 12th. That was a testimony of Gladden. Remember, they described O.J. Simpson as being kind of like a, a model or a, some kind of a poster boy for these jeans or whatever he had on. I think the way they described it, they felt that he was dressed uh, very neatly, looked very clean is the way they described him. And he was a very approachable. He put some luggage down and then turned around and forgot about the autograph and then, then gave the autograph. You recall that. Uh, it was very interesting because Ms. Clark said yesterday something to the effect, well, Mr. Simpson uh, didn't put on his socks because he left his socks at home. Now, that was one of the most interesting things she said. You've been in this man's closet. You think that O.J. Simpson has one pair of socks? Uh, I, I don't think so. I think you, you saw his closet. You saw the clothes, the way they were lined up, and the way they were. In fact, remember, I asked the witness the question. Is it trendy? Is it fashionable? that a lot of people in that part of town don't wear socks when they get dressed up to go out. Somebody said, yes, that's fashionable. That's what happens. O.J. Simpson has lots of socks. And, and the evidence is, and it's so interesting, isn't it? Because under the prosecution's theory, if, if you follow their theory, you're asked to believe that Mr. Simpson is in sweats and tennis shoes, and I presume tennis socks. That he gets this urge to go and kill his wife, and he takes off his tennis shoes and his tennis socks and puts on some dress socks and dress shoes. That doesn't make any sense, does it? but keeps on his sweat clothes according to them. That's how preposterous their theory is to try to make things fit. And you're going to see, you're going to understand that even better when we talk about these socks. So as they, O.J. Simpson then gets on the plane. And it was interesting because uh, not only did he deal with Norris and Gladden, but he had an interesting man in the first class across from Steve Valerie. You saw Valerie, a young man who for pretty much most of that flight watched O.J. Simpson. Mr. Douglas, what's that number, sir? 1245. 12.45, it just gives you some idea of this plane. We've talked earlier about Bingham, and remember Valerie was right across from O.J. Simpson as he sat up there in the, the fourth seat or something like that. And he watched him and noticed him and described for you Mr. Simpson's demeanor. He looked at O.J. Simpson's hands. That was really one of the important things about it. Because, again, when Ms. Clark, who was Dr. Clark in this regard, talked to you about these, this cut or whatever, she was describing how well, a little cut wouldn't make this amount of blood, but this, this larger cut. By all of the witnesses who didn't know each other, O.J. Simpson did not have this fish hook cut on his hand when he went to Chicago. That's unanimous. All the witnesses. You heard them. You saw them. Further, you heard the testimony of doctors Heisinger and Baden who said this is not consistent with a knife cut, it's consistent with some kind of glass cut because it's it's raggedy, it's jagged. You remember that? You remember the testimony? And we can prove it further by witnesses who saw him before he was in that room in Chicago and witnesses who saw him after. And, and we'll, we'll talk about that. So on the plane was Bingham and then we had the pilot on the plane. And the pilot who was flying the plane came back and asked Mr. Simpson to autograph the logbook, which he did, and I think we have a photograph of that. Um, again, you saw 
Tyler Stansfield, who described how Mr. Simpson was seated there reading a book, a light shining down on him, not trying to hide from anybody, not anything, sitting there reading his book, looked up, talked to the pilot, and gave his autograph, and they both continued on with their business. Then he gets to Chicago and he lands and he, he deals with Jim Merrill, the Hertz driver. You'll recall him. The Hertz driver describes the number of bags that Mr. Simpson has. In the luggage when he arrives, he describes the duffel bag, the black duffel bag, the garment bag with OJS, the golf bag, the Louis Vuitton bag. All those bags are described by Merrill. And then, of course, you remember we talked about the knapsack bag, which we think logically had golf balls in it, it was inside the golf bag. So Merrill watched O.J. in the luggage area meet with some, I think, say 20 different fans while waiting for his luggage. Merrill says he was friendly, relaxed, and he saw no noticeable cuts on his hands. That's what Jim Merrill told us. This was his testimony. So we brought him here from Chicago to testify in that regard. Now I want you to contrast Mr. Simpson's demeanor and behavior after he goes to this hotel room in Chicago. After he learns of his ex-wife's death, everybody is consistent. And again, these witnesses don't know this person. He was emotional, concerned with a cut finger. Dave Kilduff, and Mr. Simpson gets the call. Here's what I want you to think with me for a moment. I want you to look at how he reacts to this information. We've already covered how his daughter describes him. She's never heard him like this before. He immediately gets plane reservations to come back to Los Angeles. He's then trying to get back, frantically trying to leave this hotel. It's early in the morning. He's trying to get back to Los Angeles on the first thing flying. He's trying to get somebody to take him back to the airport. He's there to play in a golf tournament that day. Obviously, that's never going to happen. So, we know that Dave Kilduff, the Hertz manager, drove Mr. Simpson to the airport. Remember how he describes? Now, this is the first witness. O.J. Simpson's finger is bleeding. And this fish hook cut, this cut that he got in that room when that broken glass was there. But the prosecutors, again, with a cynical view, say, well, well, that couldn't have happened. Dr. Baden says that in talking to Mr. Simpson, he got that cut when he brushed this glass into the sink. It's entirely consistent. Doctors deal with cuts, and they said this is consistent with a glass cut. Kilduff says that O.J. Simpson is crying, and he's upset. He finally makes the plane, and I think uh, it's important to note that when he makes the plane, he sits next, to, I think, in seat nine to a lawyer by the name of Mark Partridge, just fortuitous. And I thought it was very interesting about this man, Partridge. Remember, he's the man who was a patent lawyer, who'd gone to Harvard. And he observed O.J. Simpson on this flight back. He saw him make these phone calls. He saw his emotional state. He saw him trying to gather information. He saw his finger. Uh, he saw the Band-Aid he'd had that came off. He saw that it was cut. You, you saw his testimony. These were all citizen timeline witnesses, like you or I, who were brought here pursuant to subpoena. They didn't ask to be here. They didn't volunteer. But they had relevant information about what had taken place and what had happened. So it seems to me that we, in our search for justice, in our journey toward the city of justice, must take these witnesses seriously. But you understand, with the power of the state, the prosecution had an equal access to all these witnesses, but they didn't call them. They didn't call them because they didn't fit. They didn't fit and they didn't want to hear. So the prosecutors decided to attack. And you'll remember how these witnesses generally were treated. I thought Partridge was treated especially bad. Here's a man who was so concerned about no one stealing his notes. He wrote notes about what took place. Not to publish them. He's a patent lawyer, so he understood. He put his name in the side in the margin to write down his notes because he knew it would be important. 
And we said he knew this would be important. And he sent those notes to the prosecution and to the defense. He said, I'm just a witness here. This is what I saw. Can I be of some help? They chose not to call him. They chose to attack him as though he had, like, something to hide. In fact, remember Ms. Clark standing and saying something to the effect, well, do you know how busy the LAPD was when they didn't have time to respond to you? Well, maybe not. But this was an important witness. That was the only person in the world who sat next to O.J. Simpson on a flight back from Chicago when everything he was doing, continues to do, was consistent with innocence. They didn't want to hear it, but we brought this again for you to hear. And I ask you to judge this witness as you do all the others. You remember Mark Partridge, and I think you will. And remember that it was unfair to attack a witness, a citizen witness, who seemed to be totally objective and careful. Then there was Ken Barris, the police officer in Chicago. Ms. Clark talked about him coming out here, but we brought him out here. We brought Ken Barris out here. He was the police officer who maybe three hours after O.J. Simpson left that room, went to that room at the O'Hare Plaza, was it? 11 o'clock or thereabouts, I believe. He said he went in the room. He found the glass. He found uh, the doily. He found the towel. He found the bedding because the maids had, done, had not done anything with regard to that room. He found this broken glass. And the evidence is, contrary to what the prosecutor would try to tell you, is that this glass was consistent with O.J. Simpson cutting his hand on it. And this is the cut as the fish hook cut. Now, you characterize witnesses like Cato Kalin and Partridge, Denise Pilnack and some others who felt the wrath of the prosecution, and you have to ask yourself why in the search for truth. Why did that happen? Then Mr. Simpson returns back from Chicago. And this was very interesting. And you will recall because Dr. Uh, Officer Don Thompson, I saw some of you looking at him, he's a very, very impressive big fellow. He's about six foot seven or eight. He's, he's a big guy. And you remember, he's the officer who was very interesting and very honest because he said that immediately upon Mr. Simpson coming back to Rockingham at 12 noon now, on June 13th, what happens? Van Adder had told him to hook him up. Let's see that if we can. We'll give you the number in a minute, Your Honor. You recall that Officer Thompson had testified how he'd been told by Van Adder to hook him up or to handcuff him. He grabbed him by the arm as he went in there. And you recall the photograph. I think that's Thompson there in the background, in the foreground. I thought Mr. Harris had that, but at any rate, you'll recall Mr. Simpson was standing over under a tree and he was handcuffed until the lawyer Howard Weitzman came. You recall that because we saw that during the trial. Howard Weitzman, lawyer, he's talking to Mr. Simpson. You can see that Mr. Simpson is taking out Van Adder's going over to him and taking the handcuffs off, I believe, as the conversation goes on with, with Howard Weitzman. All right, he's unhandcuffed at this point. Thank you, Mr. That was number 1250, was it? 527. 1250, Your Honor. The point of that was, we have said, and I told you at the beginning and told you in the opening statement and told you again today, this was a rush to judgment. At 12 o'clock on June 13th, Van Adder told Thompson to handcuff O.J. Simpson or to hook him up. And had a lied about that because he said in his testimony he never told him that. Thompson was very clear that he told him. He didn't do that on his own. But it shows this rush to judgment. Van Adder did not want to admit that and never did. 
we'll talk more about him when we discuss the officers together. But it seems to me the important thing for us to remember is that after this video, Mr. Simpson, you'll recall, is on his way downtown in a vehicle with Van Adder and Lang. You remember he, Howard Weitzman talks to Van Adder. Simpson gets in the car with the police in the back. Goes downtown without either his business lawyer or Howard Weitzman. Rides with the police. We know, according to the testimony in this case, he talks with Van Adder and Lang once he gets down there. I think we asked both of them about this conversation. We've heard nothing else in this, about this conversation. He has no lawyer in there with him. He has no lawyer in the car when he goes downtown. After he makes this statement to the police, which we haven't heard, he then gives a blood sample sometime around 2 o'clock or whatever that afternoon on the 13th. He voluntarily gives his blood sample. He then has a photograph taken of a cut on his finger. There's no lawyer present during all that. The lawyers are someplace else at that point. So Simpson is dealing with this himself. He wants to clear this up. He's innocent. He wants to get it all with. Everything, everything this man does is consistent with innocence. He finds out. He gets the first thing smoking. He comes back here. He goes right to his residence. He talks to the police. He goes downtown with the police. He goes in a room with the police. He has his finger photographed. He gives blood. His lawyers are off someplace else. That's what this man did on June 13th. They weren't there then. That's what he did. Consistent with innocence. They want to talk about luggage. The testimony again of this honest police officer, Thompson, is that they wouldn't let O.J. Simpson's luggage on the premises. They talk about Bob Kardashian, they smear Bob Kardashian, a good and successful, decent businessman and friend. He can't come on the premises. They have to take the luggage away. Now these people have search warrants, they can do whatever they want to do at that point. They have the power of the state. And they have the audacity to stand here and tell you that when D retired Judge Delbert Wong brings in the Louis Vuitton bag months and months and months later, there's no clothes in it? Now, is that folly? They're not supposed to unpack it? That is silly. I shouldn't waste my time on it. But that's what was said here. You heard it. And they are the ones who turned away the luggage. So you remember that when they stand up here and try to talk to you about any luggage and they didn't have it or what was in the luggage or what was it. He brought the luggage back. And if he didn't have, by the way, that portable phone in his luggage, you'd hear about that also. So understand, we're going to talk about the facts, not any speculation. So what more then could an innocent man do? We talked briefly about the cut or cuts on O.J. Simpson's hand. It's interesting, isn't it? Because the one cut, and these officers are there with their photographer. They take a photograph of this cut. Do you remember in those other pictures, there was a cut on the side of his finger here, or a nick or something like that. It looked like a paper cut, I think they said. And it's interesting, because if that cut had been there, June 13th, at 2 o'clock or whatever time they took it, do you think the police would have taken a photograph of that? They didn't, because it probably wasn't there at that point. So it's very interesting. This is the only cut they got. But we know that he nicked himself in several places, according to what he told Dr. Michael Baden. Ms. Clark makes a big thing about some smear or some little tiny smear of blood in the bathroom upstairs. O.J. Simpson had been back home since Friday. Shaved, whatever. I don't know when that got there. He didn't know when that got there. But it distract you as strange that under her hypothesis, under her theory, he comes back home with his bloody shoes on, bloody clothes, with his white carpet, goes upstairs, there's no blood anywhere. So a little tiny speck in the bathroom. Does that seem to you to be reasonable or rational or related to this case? One thing about blood spots, you can never date them, you can never tell generally how old they are. Another thing that doesn't fit, the fingerprints. They didn't call them, but we called. Gilbert Aguilar, you remember that. He's the fingerprint expert. He examined and dusted and found 17 latent prints that he was able to lift at Bundy. The crime scene, the gate, the fence, the front door. He was able to identify eight of the prints after comparing 
the known exemplars of the known ones being the police officers and people that you might expect around there. But there were nine identifiable prints that were never identified. Remember I asked about these various systems that you can put the prints in. It doesn't work for palms, but it works for prints. What efforts did you take to try to find out who do these nine identifiable prints belong to? To this day, we don't know. Are those the prints of the real killers? We will never know. They have not found those prints. We brought this witness in for you. We established this for you. The fingernail scrapings. And Mr. Sheck will talk more about this, this EAPB. But remember, there's no literature to justify how they'd want to contort and twist this. This double-banded B is more like a B than anything they can ever justify. And it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit in their case, so they can't explain it. It's like the number four allele on the steering column. There's no number fours in this case. It doesn't fit. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. They don't, and they cannot, explain that. Dr. Irwin Golden, the missing coroner. This man was trashed by his own department. It was brutal by his own boss. And if he thinks he was going to be treated any better, remember how Kelberg dismissed him at the end. He said, by the way, next time you come and testify, learn how to speak slower. That was his last remarks to a man, you look at your notes, his last remarks to a man, he kept on this stand for eight days to tell us that the cause of death was stabbing. The time of death was between nine and 12. That it could have been a single edge, a double edge. Now, that's how they treated their own witness they kept here, the coroner of Los Angeles County. But they didn't call Dr. Goldman. Why not? Why is that? Why are we left to speculate about that? They didn't like his testimony? He couldn't help them. It's the more logical and reasonable inference, isn't it? Whenever there's a witness that they couldn't fit within their little theory, they abandon him and talk bad about him. A rush to judgment. Detective Phillips, the very, very beginning of this case, Remember, I had Phillips as a witness. He's a nice man. And I quote him when he said, remember when he called the coroner? After all these hours, after all these hours out there. Now, you remember, he's off the case by then, too. Because, you know, LA, the, the robbery homicide division has taken over. They find that out at two something in the morning, remember? And they wait for Lang and Van Hatter to come until after four something. But here's Phillips still out there now. They're over at Bundy. And they call the coroner. It's like eight hours later now, as I recall. And what does he say? He's, there's a little tape, I think, that we may have. He says, I think, quote, we're sort of breaking the rules here. They're worried about how they're going to look. They're worried about the press more than they're worried about these bodies that are still out there, more than they're worried about people traipsing through that crime scene, more than they're worried about trying to protect the innocent and pursue the guilty, which they should be doing which they're required to do under the law, notify the coroner immediately. Breaking the rules, not calling criminalists. This is, this is in the early morning hours, you remember that, look at your notes. It's like eight o'clock or so, isn't it? Six o'clock. Now it's eight o'clock, because they're back from Rockingham. It's eight o'clock in the morning now. His bodies were found by Risky at 12.13. Coroner didn't come until about 10 o'clock, remember that? Fung, when he does come, goes to Rockingham before he goes to Bundy. Sort of not following the rules. That's what this case is all about. Not following the rules. They're more worried about vanity and things like that. Not about these victims. We can demand more and should demand more of our police. And it does become very relevant. Tied in with this, and so let me make it clear. We heard yesterday... Some snide comment about, well, we have the best witnesses that money could buy, or something like that in this case. Consider Dr. Henry Lee. By all accounts, the number one criminalist in America, probably in the world. He didn't take any money. The money for his time that O.J. Simpson had to pay went to the state of Connecticut to help the police and police funds. You heard that testimony. 
So it's a real, real unfortunate thing when lawyers stand here and demean people with national wonderful reputations who come in here who get compensated only for their time. The only ones not being compensated for their time here are you. And we apologize for that. But these other witnesses, the law allows them to be paid for their time out of their offices. You heard that. I'm doing this to make money, be subjected to this, be on television every day, have people probing into your private lives. Nobody wants that. It's not any fun for any of these people. But it's certainly not right to stand here and say things like that. And those aren't the facts at all as you know them. Earlier I said that there had been an offer that doctors Lee and Batten and Wolf would assist the prosecution, not accept it, but they were out here, at least to the extent they were allowed to do things. You'll hear more about the testimony of Henry Lee on that. You remember how they rushed him to this thing when he came back from Seattle and how he was treated. That was the only time he seemed to be a little bit upset. He rushed back here from Seattle and how they treated him. This Los Angeles Police Department, that's how they treated the number one criminals in the world in their search for truth. And then, Detective Lang. Lang's different than these other detectives and things. You saw Lang for about seven or eight days. Lang is different. He made mistakes. He has misstatements, as you're going to see, but he was different. Remember that one day, and I'll tell you how you can characterize and understand he's different. It's very interesting. He's been on the stand for seven or eight days. One day he came in and he was a little different. He was a little more testy, it seemed, and I asked him. I said, uh, Detective Lang, there's an article in the paper today. This is oh, it's oh, well, it's in the record. There's an article in the paper today where Mr. Darden says that you're being too nice in answering my questions. Are you going to be tougher now? You, you know about that, don't you? He said, no, Mr. Cochran, I'm just going to tell you the way it is regardless. And no matter how you ask this man a question or what anybody would want him to say, he seemed to try and answered as best he could. Now, we don't always agree with everything he did, but it was refreshing to have somebody like that who wasn't going to be told by these prosecutors anybody else what to say or what to do, even when he's criticized in the paper. And that was Lang, but I said I didn't always agree with him because I asked him, I said, when Risky said about that melting ice cream, now we're not Henry Lee. I mean, not by a long shot, but it seemed to me that if there were ice cream that was still melting, or partially melted, at 1240 when Risky saw it, and that's Risky's testimony, partially melted ice cream at 1240, that they don't bother picking up. And that ice cream, remember when you were at Bundy? That ice cream is when you go down those steps, and it's on that little banister there as you're going out into the garage. Might mean that Nicole Brown Simpson went down there and was letting somebody out who'd been there earlier that evening? We'll never know. When he saw all those candles lit around the bathtub and water in the bathtub, we'll never know because they didn't bother checking. They were too worried about how they would look, notifying them, worrying about the press. We'll never know. They said the ice cream wasn't important, but it was important enough that they had, and this is the evidence, they had an ice cream melting test. Remember I asked Lang about this again. Lang's experiment showed that this ice cream it went back to Ben and Jerry's. It was Ben and Jerry's ice cream, remember that? It melted in an hour and 15 minutes. It should be totally melted by that time frame. If you extrapolate backwards, if Risky finds the ice cream at 1240 and is partially melted, let's give him the benefit of the doubt and let's say it's all melted. If you went back an hour and 15 minutes, that's 1125. Now, if the children are asleep, Nicole's the one eating that ice cream. That seems important to us. Maybe not to them. That seems important. That's another bit of evidence. When you cannot, because of negligence and incompetence, determine the cause of death, you have to look at other things. Isn't that reasonable? Those are the facts, ladies and gentlemen. That's what happened in this case. So they tell you it's not important. We think that is important. Another factor. You remember that photograph in the kitchen where there's a butcher knife on the table and you see some flowers there? Seems to me that when they came home, that butcher knife was used to cut whatever was off the flowers, if it was a string or 
some rubber band, place those flowers in a vase or whatever in that kitchen. You look at those photographs when you get a chance. And I am always intrigued about the things they didn't do in this case, even Risky, who said, and it was kind of was refreshing, have you had any training at crime scenes? He said, well, they kind of glossed over that at the, at the academy. Remember he said that? People could have fa fallen over when he said that. They glossed over uh, training at crime scenes at the academy. And boy, was that ever more true. The first officer on the scene told us that. We knew that right early on, didn't we? It's not anything we made up. It's not about being anti-police. You saw the police you could believe, and you now know the ones you can't believe. And anybody, anybody who believes that all police are perfect, that they don't lie, that they don't have the same biases and racism that the rest of society has, is living in a dream world. So this is not for the faint of heart. This is not for the timid. As I said, this is for the courageous who understand what the Constitution is all about. That's what we're talking about here. And so, let's look at Risky, the very outset. In addition, he doesn't get any training, but he goes in the house and the first thing he does, he picks up the phone and uses it. I said, well, didn't you think that might mar some fingerprints? Or if it had one of those numbers where you could get the last number call, wouldn't that be important? Uh, did you think about that? Well, he didn't think about that. Did you think about the fact that, you know, that you shouldn't be touching that phone and you have a rover. You have some, on your hip, some way to call. You could have used those portable phones that Phillips had with all those private numbers on them. You could have done all those things, but you didn't use any of those things. You walked in there and then you didn't notice that on that phone in the kitchen, when they're looking so hard for Mr. Simpson, that there's a speed dialer that you press a button and it says Dad, and it says Nana, and it says all the people. If they'd wanted to notify the next of kin, when they call, press the button, they could have called Nana. But not these investigators. They didn't think about doing that. They're too busy hatching a plan, standing around in the street, doing nothing from 2 to 4.30. These are the facts. This is what you heard. This is this case, the so-called trial of the century. This is how they conducted themselves. And then we come to those socks. Those socks. They just don't fit. They just don't fit. They just don't fit. Watch with me now a video. I want you to watch the time counter in this time frame. And you'll understand how important this is. Now where it says 3.13 p.m., Mr. Willie Ford says, all right, back, back it up, please. This is Mr. Willie Ford going up into the bedroom. It's 3.13, which he says is 4.13, because it hadn't been changed. This is 4.13 p.m. on June 13th, 1994. Okay, thank you, Howard. You look at the foot of the bed there, where the socks are supposed to be. You'll see no socks in this video. And you'll recall that Mr. Willie Ford testified about this. And I asked him, well, well where, where are the socks, Mr. Ford? I didn't see any socks. So now, that's interesting, isn't it? At 4.13, on June 13, 1994, these socks, they supposedly recovered. These mysterious socks. These socks that no one sees any blood on until August 4th, all of a sudden. These socks that are picked up that Looper says he picks them up because they just look out of place. I don't have any reason to pick them up. I'll just take these socks. They're out of place. The only items that they took out of that place on that day is Lang. Lang takes the Reebok tennis shoes, the ones he takes home. You remember that? That's all they really take because they don't come back on the 28th before they get that one brown glove. But these socks will be their undoing. It just doesn't fit. So none of you can deny there are no socks at the foot of that bed at 4.13 p.m. Where then are the socks? Where are these socks, this important piece of evidence? Well, let's, let, me, let me show you something. This board here was a board used by Dr. Henry Lee. And this is interesting. Bear with me for a moment as you look at this. 52. Uh, Thank you. And this photograph here, the one on the left, Your Honor, 
So you notice something. The socks are at the foot of the bed. If you look close at this photograph, you'll see it. There's no little white card there. You notice how they, they put these little evidence cards there when they're going to collect something. No little white card on this photograph here. And this is interesting because you see these straps on the bed. Now, Looper told us when he testified, these straps were like he called them some kind of luggage straps. And these luggage straps are down at this point, aren't they? See how they're down? And no evidence card. And the socks are there. And we come over to this photograph here. You notice how the strap is now up on the bed. It's no longer hanging down anymore. It's been moved up. And Looper says that's when he looks under this bed and he sees that photograph. By the way, how wrong can they continue to be? That's no wedding photograph. That's a, wedding, that's a photograph they took at some formal event. You look at that photograph and see. That's how they speculate. And most times they've been wrong. But this is, a, this, this, this is interesting. The strap is now up on the bed. And you look at the socks. Now there's, it's been posed for you. Here's this number 13 out here with these socks. Now, if you look back at that video, and you'll have it, you'll notice that the video has the strap down. So the video is at a time before this card is placed, before the strap is up, before this is about to be collected. Now, isn't that strange? Because at 4.13, there are no socks there. Now, how do we tie all this together? You remember Fung and Mazzola have a log. And on their log, they tell when they collected things. They tell us that they collected the blood in the foyer at 4.30. That they then come upstairs. That they collect... Here it is as we speak. Got to move it over a little bit, Mr. Harris, I think. Do we? Now you see this. Well, they collected things sequentially, and they kept this log. And I think that you'll remember the testimony that at 4.30, they collected the blood in the foyer. Remember that? Let me see if I can point that out for us. In foyer, red stain. And there's testimony. They testify at 4.30. 16.30 is 4.30. This is, this, is, well, this is at least 17 minutes after Mr. Ford's up there with that camera where there are no socks, right? So 16.30, right there. They're downstairs. Then they say they go upstairs. And they leave this time blank, but at 16.40, they go and they look at this little red spot in the bathroom. Remember that? And they say in their testimony that the socks are collected between 1630 and 1640. So that's given the benefit of the doubt. 1635. How could the socks be there at 435 when you just saw they're not there at 413? Who's fooling whom here? They're setting this man up and you can see it with your own eyes. You're not naive. Nobody's foolish here. And then they forget about this little strap exercise. When they're posing stuff here, they move this off the bed, move this under the bed, they're going to make a big thing about this photograph under the bed. And then they put this number down here and they take these pictures for you later. But they didn't know that we would know or find out about Mr. Ford's video. See, they took that video. You know, we talked about this early on. LAPD should always take videos of everything at that crime scene. They don't do that. But they took this video. Not because they wanted to help Mr. Simpson. If anything got, was missing or got broken, this was a civil liability video. Remember, they was going around taking photographs of things that might be missing or whatever. If there was ever a suit later on. But they got hoisted by their own petard again. Because the video has the counter and the number. They will never, ever be able to explain that to you. Because we got their testimony in black and white. As to when they went upstairs and collected this. Those socks from the beginning have been a thorn. It's going to bring them down. So those are the socks. These socks. No dirt. No soil. No berries. No trace. Nobody sees any blood until August 4th. And all these miraculous things start happening. And then Mr. Sheck will talk more about this. Then we find out it has EDTA in it. It's a planet along with that back gate. 
how would it be on there? Why didn't they see the blood before that? There's a big fight here. Where's the dirt? Why would Mr. Simpson have on these kind of socks with the sweat outfit? Wait a minute. Now, you, you don't have to be like from the fashion police to know that. You don't wear those kind of socks. You wear those kind of socks with a suit. You don't wear those kind of socks with a sweat outfit. Doesn't make sense to you that those socks were in that hamper from Saturday night when Mr. Simpson went to that formal event. Those kind of socks is what you wear with your tuxedo when he was dressed with those other ladies. If they went and took it out of the hamper and staged it there, then you see what happened. Is that not reasonable under these facts? I think you'll agree it is. It's the only reasonable explanation if it's posed there. And the reason for doing this is because they were out of place. But isn't that interesting? In the hamper in which Looper went and they all went, they didn't take anything else. You'd think the police would ask, Mr. Simpson, what were you wearing in addition to the suits? What, what were you wearing that night? They didn't take one thing. Yet we hear all of this talk about, wonder where the clothes went, wonder where the clothes went. You think Mr. Simpson, who told them everything, who cooperated with them fully, told them like he told them about those shoes, what he was wearing. They didn't bother collecting those, did they? No towels, no nothing. She's worried about him taking this quick shower. If he took a shower, and there's so much blood, and he's covered with blood, why didn't they bring the towels in here? Something is wrong in this case. It just doesn't fit. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. So the socks, I could talk about these socks forever, but I'm not going to because Mr. Sheck will talk about the forensic aspect of it. But let me just remind you of two quick more things. Dr. Herb McDonald came in here and he told you there was no splatter or spatter on these socks. These socks had compression transfer. And he used his hands to show you somebody took those socks and they put something on them. And it went all the way through to side three. Now with all their experts, Bring people back three, four times. They never had anybody to contravene that. How'd, this, how'd, that, how'd that get over to side three? How'd it get over there? It wouldn't get there if there was a leg in the sock. Can anybody explain that? Any of you explain that? Maybe Ms. Clark can explain that. The experts can't explain it. Something is wrong. And then finally the EDTA, which indicates the anti-ferrogulant from a purple top tube. That's where that blood is from. The socks, as you know, is something that you want to get emotional about. Because we've known about these socks for some time. This is, to say the least, disturbing. It's worse than that, though. In my opening statement, I told you about evidence that would be compromised, contaminated, and corrupted. And I told you something then. I said, in this case, there's something even far more sinister. The socks are one example of that. Now, if you want to be fair, decide in this case, you've got to deal with these socks. You'll get a chance to see them. Look for the dirt that you expect on them. Look for the spatter that you expect on them. Look and see why it went over to side three. There's a leg in it. And you know, isn't it interesting how you get this blood on this sock with your pants? Your pants have to be almost up. This would take a real contortion to do it. There's no way they can explain it. So let's just leave it where it is and Mr. Sheck will pick up on that. And then we've heard a lot about the so-called blood in the Bronco. And I want to tell you I'm not anything like a scientist. In fact, when my mother and my father wanted me to become doctors, I didn't because I wasn't that good in science. So I became a lawyer so I could talk. But let me tell you something. Even I know about amounts of blood, especially after this case. They tell you about all this blood in the Bronco. And you remember one of the early witnesses testified the total amount of blood on this console, on this console, is 0.07 of a drop of blood. Now that's a, supposedly a mixture of Goldman and someone else. So now this is, I'm going to do a little 
Henry Lee experiment, and I hope that it doesn't uh, cause me, cause you any problems. Now, 0 0.07 of a drop. Douglas, you're going to have to take this down. That is your young. 0 0.07 of a drop. Not even that much is the amount, the testimony in this case is, of the alleged blood on that console. Now, this is an amazing thing. Because you remember, this is the vehicle in tradition of everything else they did in this case that's picked up. It's towed away from Rockingham. You've all seen that photograph. It's taken over and ultimately it ends up at Vertel's. Remember Blazzini? William Blazzini. Before we got to Blazzini, we dealt with John Mraz. Mraz says that the vehicle was just open. You can just go get in it. The press was waiting for him before he even drove it back. Everybody knew this was O.J. Simpson's vehicle. And they were all looking in it. Supposedly for all this blood that's supposed to be in here. And this killer must have been covered in blood. And they say, say he drove this Bronco and he got in the place. would be covered with blood, wouldn't it? So everybody's looking for the blood. So Mariah said, he gets inside the car, he didn't see any blood. Mariah said that. They maligned Mariah because Mariah said, yeah, I did take those receipts out of there that had, one had Mr. Simpson's name on it, one had Mrs. Simpson's name on it. But he said he didn't see any blood in there. They never called anybody to contravene that. But we want to make sure you understood what was happening. So we call William Blazzini, the man who works for Pick Your Part, as far as vehicles. And he was a pretty good witness, wasn't he? He said, look, this is my business, is looking in cars because I go in and buy them. He says, I got in that car on June 21st. And first of all, I said, I, I went looking for blood because I'd heard in the news there's going to be lots of blood in this car. So I went and got in the Bronco. It's not secured as usual. Bob Jones said, oh, there it is over there. Go get in it. Now, this is the same vehicle. No holes on it. Could be released to Hertz. LAPD at work. He gets in the car on the driver's side where he stays almost five minutes. Looking down, looking for blood, looking in the front. And remember, he takes his fingerprints or hands and puts them in the, in the mirror. It's kind of like a souvenir. In the right front window of the car. Doesn't see any blood. So he looks all over for blood. Then he gets out, walks around, and I guess on the rear panel. Says, I'll leave him again. Puts his fingerprints there again. And he walks around, looks inside the driver's side, looks back, looks all down on the console, looking for blood. He's looking for blood, ladies and gentlemen. On June 21st, doesn't see any blood. Then he gets in the car. I ask him, did you look on the dash? Did you look on the door? Did you look on the console? Doesn't see any blood. He says that the patch on the bottom was cut out, the, the floor, floor mat there. Doesn't see any blood. And Ms. Clark cross-examined this man. He said, look, Bronco's kind of high up. When I was getting ready to get in there, I rested my hands on the thing, and I looked right up there, and there was no blood in that Bronco. Now, this is very strange, isn't it? Here's the Bronco that has blood that appears, disappears, and then reappears, and then disappears. This is a vehicle that's supposed to be secure, but it's not secure. Everybody gets in it. Mirage got in it. Take stuff out that could have been helpful. We know that there was a receipt in there from Nicole Brown Simpson. There's testimony. She rides and drives that car on occasion. That's forever lost to us because they didn't do their jobs again. Blazzini comes along. There's no blood in there. How do you explain all this when they talk about, they stand up here and talk about an ocean of evidence and, I mean, as I said, it's a little tiny trickle of a stream of anything. They're just words that they use. So this Bronco is particularly troubling. Less than that, seven-tenths of that drop of blood is what's in that ledge console. Dr. Baden says the perpetrator would be covered with blood. Your common sense tells you the perpetrator would be covered with blood. A five to 15 minute battle and struggle of this dimensions. And so, it just doesn't fit. Something is wrong. How does anyone drive away in that car with bloody clothes, with no blood there on the seats, no blood anyplace else. Every police officer came in 
talked about how bloody this scene was. It doesn't make any sense. You can't explain it because Mr. Simpson was not in that car and didn't participate in these murders. That's the reasonable and logical explanation. None other will do. And it's too late for them to change now with these kind of shifting theories. So the prosecution then has no shoes, no weapon, no clothes. They don't have anything except these socks, which appear all of a sudden under these circumstances. Now, when you want to think about the depths to which people will go to try to win, when you want to talk about an obsession to win, I'm going to give you an example. There was a witness in this case named Fano Paradis. This is a man who's their man who took O.J. Simpson's blood. This is a man who had a subpoena at one point, said he could have come down there and testified. They didn't call him. So by the time we wanted to call him, he's unavailable because of his heart problem, remember? So what we did was we read you his grand jury testimony, I believe, and we played for you his preliminary hearing testimony. And in that testimony, it was very, very consistent. Been a nurse for a number of years, you saw him. Works for the city of Los Angeles. Says that when he took this blood from O.J. Simpson on June 13th, he took between 7.9 and 8.1 cc's of blood. That's what he said. That's real simple, isn't it? We knew that. It's sworn, tell the truth, under oath, both places. Grand jury and preliminary hearing. Pretty clear, isn't it? Pretty clear. Except you remember that in my opening statement I told you, I said, you know, something's wrong here. Something sinister is here. Something is wrong. Because if we take all their figures and assume they took 8 cc's of blood, the 6.5 cc's accounted for, there is 1.5 cc's missing of this blood. There's some missing blood in this case. Where is it? Prosecution wants to explain that for you too, make everything real easy for you. So what do they do? What do they do? We've been talking about the police here before, but what do they do? Hank Goldberg, doesn't give us any notice. Goes out there with the video camera with Oppler and this other lady, Miss Ramirez. And they take this bizarre home video of Paratus sitting there talking and mouthing words. It's the most bizarre thing. I mean, as jurors, I'm sure you've seen some pretty high quality testimony here. But this was bizarre. He's sitting there talking about, well, you know, gee, I, I don't really remember how much I took. And he's going through all these gyrations. It was sad. The depths to which they had sunk to try as part of this cover-up. Try and convince you that this man hadn't taken eight cc's of blood. And at the very end of this case, we put in a syringe for you. The kind of syringe they used. And this syringe, it's interesting enough, has markers on it. Not only, this wasn't a guessing game. It has eight cc's right on it. I think it was a 10 cc syringe. So he knew what was taken. But that's the depths to which they will go to try to make it fit. And it just doesn't fit. That's what they'll do. You have to watch them. This is a classic example. You saw it with your own eyes. You heard the testimony. Need I say more? Is that a classic example? And then there's another concrete example. Let's take Miss Laura McKinney. By all accounts, a nice and gentle lady who didn't want to be here. You heard the testimony. I had to go all the way to North Carolina to try to get these tapes. I had to go all the way to the North Carolina Court of Appeals to get these tapes. She comes here. She has proof by what she says. You know, there's conversations and there's conversations. But she has the conversations on tape. These prosecutors... If you don't fit, you're going to have trouble. So much so that Mr. Darden is questioning her. Remember her famous response? Quote, why are we having this adversarial conversation? Why do I detect this negativity? I'm just here 
to tell the truth. Aren't you in a search for truth, Mr. Prosecutor? She said that. And then they wanted to ask, well, why didn't you stop him from using this so-called N-word? She said, I was in a journalistic mode. I didn't try to stop him from using that word any more than I tried to stop him from talking about cover-ups where male police officers have no respect for women police officers because they don't cover up the misdeeds. That was her testimony. From that witness stand, you saw her. She's credible. Don't you think? She has tapes to back her up. But look how she was treated by this. And Mr. Darden said something very interesting today. He said, I'm just the messenger. Now, now how many times have you heard that? I'm the messenger. Don't blame me. I'm just doing my job. That's no way out. He's a fine lawyer. But he can't hide behind just being the messenger. Well, whose message is he sending? Who is he representing in this message? He's a man of integrity. That statement is not going to fly. I'm just the messenger. He's not any messenger. He's the prosecutor with all the power of the state of California in this case. We're not going to let that get away. They're not going to turn the Constitution on its head in this case. We're not going to allow it. And so now, let me bring you to a segment of this discussion where we talk about if you can't trust the messengers, watch out for their message. Van Adder, the man who carries the blood. Furman, the man who finds the glove. Remember those two phrases. Van Adder, the man who carries the blood. Furman, the man who found the glove. Now, Detective Van Adder has been a police officer for 27, 28 years. An experienced LAPD robbery homicide man. He was put on this case because of his experience, presumably, because they had the resources downtown. You know what time he got there and knew what happened. One of the things that has been totally unexplainable to me is the fact that here you have Mr. Simpson cooperating fully. Gives his blood. He gives eight cc's of blood, we now know. Van Adder, the blood is then turned over to Van Adder. Now, we know that he could have booked that blood in Parker Center, or he could have gone over to Piper Tech. You see these two residents here. Thank you, Mr. Douglas. And, Your Honor, this is, uh, okay, this is just the board. Apparently, there's not a number on this. He's at Parker Center, right over here in the police building, right down here at 150 North Los Angeles Street. Takes this blood. Could have gone a couple of floors and booked the blood. That manual requires. But he didn't do that, did he? Could have gone over to Piper Tech, another facility right downtown here, and booked that blood. This is the reference sample of Mr. O.J. Simpson. He doesn't do that. What he does is he goes way out to this area marked Brentwood Heights. Must be 20, 25 miles, 20 some miles to go way out there. Carrying the blood in this unsealed gray envelope, supposedly. Why is he doing that? Why is Van Hatter carrying Mr. Simpson's blood out there? Why is he doing that? Doesn't make any sense. Violates their own rules. Why is he doing that in this case? Has he ever done it in the other case? No. Name another case where this has happened. Or you can ask him those questions all the time with Bushy. Officer Bushy, when have you ever sent four people, four detectives over, to notify somebody who's not even the next of kin? Well, Mr. Carkin, mm, there must, must be somebody, but I can't name you a case. There are no cases. These are the things they did in this case. So he goes way out there with that blood. Why did he do that? It doesn't make any sense. And so we know because we again. Much of what happened here is on video. It's the strangest thing about this, this blood. He can't explain either why he carries it out there. And then it gets even stranger, doesn't it? Because supposedly, after the blood is carried out to O.J. Simpson's residence, Van Adder gives the blood to Fung, according to what we hear. But Fung then uses some kind of a trash bag, a black trash bag, and gives it to Mazzola, but he doesn't tell her that it's blood. Isn't that bizarre? Remember the video when Mazzola's walking along, carrying it, almost bumping into the, 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 the hedges and the shrubbery? It's the most bizarre thing you've ever seen. She doesn't even know it. 
And then, talk about cover-ups, Mazzola is asked, well, do you see, did you see when Van Anner gave the blood to Fung? And she says, oh, uh, no, I had sat down on the couch and I was closing my eyes uh, in Mr. Simpson's couch at that moment. I, I wasn't looking at that moment. Sound like a cover-up to you? Always looking the other way? Not looking, don't want to be involved? Covering for somebody? It's bizarre. Absolutely bizarre, and it's untrue. It doesn't fit. So Van Atta, the man who carries the blood, starts lying in this case from the very, very beginning, trying to cover up for this rush to judgment. Those are words. That's rhetoric. Let me prove it for you. He tells us, and this is a board. The board's entitled, Van Adder's Big Lies. The man who carried the blood. He tells us, that O.J. Simpson is not a suspect. That's the biggest lie we've heard probably in this entire trial. O.J. Simpson is not a suspect. They handcuff him within 30 to 45 seconds of the time he gets back here. He lies about that. Weitzman succeeds in gets him, getting him unhandcuffed and they take him downtown. But he does more than that. Not only does he lie about that at the beginning, he then feels comfortable enough to talk to these two brothers, the Fiato brothers, and an FBI agent named Wax. And isn't this bizarre that a, the lead detective in this case, put on here because of his experience, is talking with these two guys who've been in this witness program for quite a while testifying for the government. Now we know that in a rather unusual set of circumstances, they're in a room somewhere in some hotel drinking beer. It's not even Van Adder's case. And they're sitting around talking. And I asked the FBI agent, weren't you a little surprised that a detective would be talking to these two people about the Simpson case? Well, we found out that there was a relationship allegedly between Denise Brown and one of these brothers and maybe he felt comfortable. But why would he do that? And what does he say? He tells them that we didn't go up there to save any lives. O.J. Simpson was a suspect. The husband is always the suspect. But then he comes into court here. This lead detective takes the stand again and lies to you under oath. Says, oh, well, no, I never said that. Never said that. That'd be a mistake if they said that. I, I never made that statement. He lied. He lied from the very beginning. He lied when they went over there. Then they bring in Commander Bushy, an otherwise good man. They get him involved in this. Let me tell you something interesting about what you heard about Phillips's voice. Phillips was talking to the coroner's office about 7, 8 o'clock in the morning on June 13th. The man asked him to identify, well, yes, we have one male, female, one, one white female, one white male, uh, as though he didn't know the names or whatever. Now, this is five and a half hours after Bushy said, go over and notify O.J. Simpson, who's not even the next of kin because we don't want the family to find out about this like they did in the Belushi case. Remember he said that? Now he's doing all this from his house, from his, from his home. Phillips, if you look through his testimony, look back through your notes as to when he says he knows who this person is. But isn't it amazing that the children are already down at the station? They're at, at her house. They got a phone with a speed dialer. They know. Bushy knows. They don't follow his orders out. They stand out in the street, not investigating. Stand out in the street, planning, doing whatever they're going to do. But one thing they do, they decide that O.J. Simpson is a suspect in this case. And let me tell you why you're going to know that. They want to talk a lot about 1985, but he missed the whole point. In 1985, something interesting happened in this case. In 1985, Mark Furman responded to a call on Rockingham. Mark Furman is a lying, perjuring, genocidal racist. And from that moment on, any time he could get O.J. Simpson, he would do it. That's when. It started in 85, when Farrell asked all the officers at West L.A., or 10 of them, you know anything about this residence? Only one steps forward. And what does he say? It's indelibly impressed in my mind 
that call back in 85. Four years later, sits down and writes a report. And now, he knew what he was going to do on this particular night. So, OJ, not a suspect, went to save lives. So he wanted to get a search warrant. That's why they were lying. Denies the statement to Wax and Fiato. Then, to get that search warrant, he lies to a judge. He says in the search warrant that OJ left unexpectedly from Chicago. And there's some writing on the search warrant. I think it's in evidence. And it's kind of interesting because everybody knew. Cato knew he was going to Chicago. Everybody knew he was going to Chicago. It wasn't any unexpected trip, but I suppose it would help out. In fact, you think about it. Ms. Clark said this. Well, that's why those socks were out there and everything, because he left in a hurry, like he had one pair of socks. We know why those socks were out there. He left unexpectedly to try and justify what they were doing. It all comes back to Furman when he says in that letter, if I see an interracial couple, I'll stop them. If I don't have a reason, I'll make up a reason. This man thinks he's above the law. And even Darden, Mr. Darden, Mr. Christopher Darden, my friend, has to admit, he said it was textbook what's happened to their witness, not our witness. And so he lies to the judge. He lied to the judge. He's lied to you, his jurors. Then he says that Arnell and Cato said O.J. left unexpectedly. That's written in the warrant. Never say any other kind. Cato knew this was a planned trip for Hertz. He talked to Kathy Randa. Then in the search warrant, he puts that it was confirmed there was human blood on the door. That's never been tested, even to this day. Another lie in this search warrant. He denies telling Thompson the order to handcuff O.J. Simpson. Then he lies about O.J. Simpson's blood. Remember during his testimony, he got that blood about 2.30, and he was trying to push it back an hour, so we'll like maybe 3.30, because he had to explain, it was, it was hard to explain those hours in there. What's he walking around with this man's blood for? for? For three hours before he goes back out to Rockingham at 5.30? What's he doing with this blood? So he has an hour in there, and you look at his testimony, he lies about it between 2.30 and 3.30. Then Furman testifies, between these two, I don't know who you can believe, when Furman testifies, something about that, when he talks to Cato, Cato tells him about these thumps, that he doesn't tell anybody about it. He's so central to this case. He's got to be the big man and go solve this entire case. He doesn't tell the rest of them. Remember, he goes off all by himself for 15 minutes. Just walking around, he goes off by himself somewhere. Supposedly where he supposedly finds this glove. No opportunity? We'll be talking about that. But Van Adder comes in and says, well, yes, the Furman told me about the thumps on the wall. Contrary to what Furman had said. So, these are the lies of the co-lead detective in this case. If you cannot trust the messenger, you can't trust the message that they're trying to give you. You can't trust the message. So this man who starts to lie from the very, very beginning, I'll leave it up just a second. We covered the lies and the things that he did. And then they rope in Commander Bushy try to back him up by saying, well, I'd ordered them to do this, a direct order to do this. But isn't that interesting now? Let's think about this. You look at those logs and see how many police officers came out to Bundy and Rockingham. Maybe more than 30. You think that of those number of officers, that maybe one of them, maybe one of the patrol officers could have went to give the notice? It took all four detectives, all four LAPD experienced detectives to leave the bodies. They had notified the coroners. They didn't have a criminalist to go over to notify O.J. Simpson. Who's fooling who here? This is preposterous. They're lying. Let's try to get over that wall to get in that house. If you don't believe so, you're talking about saving lives? Remember what Arnell said. First of all, they all make this big mistake. They forget, and they say, well, when we leave from the back, we go right in that back door of the house there. We go right in the back door. But they forgot. Arnell Simpson comes in here and testifies, you can't go in the back door. Because remember, Cato had put on the alarm. You had to go around the house to the front. Arnell 
had to open the keypad to let them in. Remember? You think who knows better? You think she knows better or they know better? She had to open it to let them in. They're so worried about dead bodies and people being in that house and saving lives. Who goes in first? Arnell Simpson goes in first. These big brave police officers and the young lady just walks on in there first. They don't go upstairs looking. They just want to be inside that house and make her leave. Or give Furman a chance to start what he's doing, strolling around the premises and doing what he's doing there. Then we come to Detective Phillips, a nice man, but even he makes misstatements in this situation. Now he knows Furman probably better than anybody because he's the one who calls Furman. He's the one who works with Furman. Now, Furman, in the culture of LAPD, has been promoted. We have heard that in 85, when he goes out to this incident, he's a patrol officer. Now he's a detective, moving up in the ranks, working with Phillips. And Phillips calls him after 1 o'clock. Furman's been somewhere down at La Quinta in the desert, and he comes back supposedly, and he gets his call to respond to this location. And even Detective Phillips, in this case, and I examined him. When asked, well, Furman told you, didn't he, about his going out on that call in 85 about this so-called domestic discord and then the 89 situation. You knew about that, didn't you? Phillips, oh, no, 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 I never knew anything. Nobody told me anything. I don't know anything about that. No, 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 I didn't. And then Lang comes in here. And in Lang and Van Atta's report, right in the report, and it's in evidence, exhibit 1021, Lang directly impeaches Phillips that Phillips did tell him about the 85 incident. The, the firm had told him he'd been out on it. Why would he do that? Now these are facts, ladies and gentlemen. This is what happened in this case before your very eyes. Not anything I'm making up. And who would know Mark Furman better in this case? His lack of credibility, his lying, racist views than Ron Phillips, his supervisor who apparently chose to look the other way, and I'm sure he's as embarrassed as anybody else by this disgrace, Furman. So it's important at the outset that we understand the role of Phillips as we need to understand the role of Van Anna. He was the one allegedly given this order by Bushy to go over and give the death notification. He didn't comply with it until much later. And presumably the reason they were going to go over was to give the notice to Mr. Simpson and Furman was going because he was needed. Now can you imagine this? Furman with his views, genocidal views, was going to go over to give notice to O.J. Simpson to help O.J. Simpson in his time of need. Can you imagine that? He's going over there to help him, help him with his kids. That is ludicrous. So from risky to bushy you've seen and are seeing a part of this code of silence, this cover-up. The cover-up that Laura McKinney talks about. Where male officers get together, cover up for each other, don't tell the truth, hide, turn their head, cover. You can't trust this evidence. You can't trust the messenger. You can't trust the message. When Furman gets on the witness stand and says, I haven't used this N-word for 10 years. Think Phillips knows he's lying? Some of you probably knew he was lying. But took those tapes to make those of you who didn't believe that these kind of things exist to take place. Didn't he have an obligation to come forward? Under those circumstances? For if Furman would speak so candidly to this lady that he met in a restaurant in West L.A., you think he talks like that to the guys on the force? She talked about, he said those words in police administration and police procedures. That's the way he talks. That's the way he is. Nobody 
came forward to reveal this. We revealed it for you. Let me just take a moment. This whole thing about the police and what they've done in this case is extremely painful to us and I think to all right-thinking citizens. Because you see, we live in Los Angeles and we love this place. But all we want is a good and honest police force where people are treated fairly no matter what part of the city they're in. That's all you want. So in talking to you about this, understand there is no personal pride. But I told you when we started, this is not for the weak or for the faint of heart. And so let's move on then. Just wanted to show you this uh, part from Detective Phillips. This is what was asked of Phillips at 15084. Mr. Simpson and Ms. Nicole Brown Simpson had been embroiled in previous domestic discord situations, one of these resulting in Mr. Simpson having to go to court. You told them that too, didn't you? Answer, Phillips. I never told him that. He's talking about to Lang. So if, my question, if Detective Lang so indicates in his report, he's wrong. Answer, if he tells you that, I told him that, he may have learned that from Detective Furman, but he didn't get, didn't get the information from me. I never knew that. 